uh, is a resolution that was brought to us uh, from Commissioner Denson and Commissioner Parker um, uh, regarding uh, desire to ensure that um, landlord-tenant relationships are, are operated with grace and positivity. Uh, and this is a prospective request of the commission, um, not binding in, in the sense of the force of law, but uh, in terms of our desire for um, ideal behavior from everyone. So, uh, Commissioner Parker, do you want to introduce the item? Yes, Mr. absolutely. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd first like to start off by thanking the Mayor and Commission for their flexibility in allowing this item to appear on the agenda today. Um, for weeks, and especially in the days approaching the 1st of April, I know all of us have received numerous calls from residents and property owners concerned about paying their rent for the month of April and potentially um, months coming. And I've heard increasing calls from community advocates for us to intervene. Um, just yesterday, a mother and a Georgia hospital worker called the Athens Mutual Aid Network hotline to seek rent assistance to pay her daughter's rent at Abbey West Apartments. Um, her daughter and husband were both laid off due to COVID-19, and since her daughter is now unemployed and all classes have been moved online, they cleared out her apartment and she moved home. They are now struggling between deciding whether to pay for basic necessities or pay $540 for an empty apartment. And I think that this story, while um, individual, is emblematic of an increasingly common set of occurrences that we will see in our community in the weeks that come, and um, mounting or heeding these uh, mounting urgencies, um, Commissioner Denson and I convened last night to draft the following resolution and agitate for its passage within a timeline that allows its contents to make the most significant impact. So I say all that to say, I really appreciate you all hearing us out under this somewhat compressed time frame. And for full clarity for those that might be watching, as well as uh, commissioners who may have received this resolution this afternoon, I would like to go ahead and just read some sections of it. Um, that helps establish some of the context for its, its um, salience and some transparency about what the resolution actually does. So whereas on March 19th, and this is the bottom of page one, uh, pursuant to their authority under the Ar athens Clark County Emergency Management Ordinance, the athens Clark County Mayor and Commission adopted a second declaration of local emergency that closed non-essential businesses across athens Clark County. And whereas on March 23rd, 2020, Governor Brian Kemp issued a shelter-in-place order for medically fragile individuals and ordered the shutdown of bars and light nightclubs across the state. And whereas, because of these orders and the impact on service and other industries, labor organizations representing hospitality workers estimate that 80% or more of hospitality workers will lose their jobs, along with thousands of arts, travel, nonprofit, retail, and service workers. And whereas unemployment claims to the Depart Georgia Department of Labor are expected to increase into the hundreds of thousands, and whereas those workers who are eligible for unemployment insurance are drawing only a fraction of what they would otherwise earn, and many workers are not eligible for any unemployment benefits at all, and whereas the Federal Reserve has found that 40% of Americans do not have cash on hand to cover an unexpected expense of $400, and whereas though the Supreme Court Justice of Georgia issued a judicial emergency order that stopped the time frame for all dispossessory cases statewide, enabling the Magistrate Court of athens Clark County to temporarily halt evictions, Renters are still obligated to pay landlords, and homeowners with mortgages are still obligated to pay their lenders. And whereas data from the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing suggests that nearly half of Athenians are housing cost burdened, paying more than 30% of their income for housing. And whereas retaining the obligation to pay would mean that those who defer payments will accumulate significant debt. And whereas the athens Clark County Commission believes that housing is a human right and that it is critically important that Athenians who, are, who currently have housing are not made homeless or destitute because of this public health crisis. And whereas pursuant to Code Section 38351 of the G Official Code of Georgia, the state of emergency declared by Governor Brian Kemp empowers the governor to perform and exercise emergency functions, powers, and duties as may be deemed necessary to promote and secure the safety and protection of the civilian population. And whereas on March 12, 2020, one of the first responses to the economic impact of, COVID, of the COVID-19 crisis by the U.S. federal government was to inject $1.5 trillion in loans to banks to stabilize the economy. And whereas to date, no rent relief program is in place and mortgage forbearance guidance for single-family homeowner mortgages has been issued by Freddie Mac, but that guidance remains subject to individual banks to decide if and how to implement and whereas banks are therefore able to withstand non-payment of debt during this emergency and work out extensions and other ways for debt to be refinanced when the health emergency is over, and whereas by halting mortgage payments during this time, the urgent need for landlords to collect rent will be paused, 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by Athens Park County Commission that the Mayor and Commission of Athens Park County call on all landlords renting or leasing commercial or residential property that lies within Athens Park County to enact the following during the duration of the crisis. Freeze rents on all residents and pledge not to issue any rent increases. Halt evictions on renters as in extraordinary circumstances. Waive late fees for residents who pay rent after the rent due date because they have been affected by COVID-19 and related government actions. Offer flexible payment plans for residents who cannot pay their rent by the due date. Direct renters to available resources to assist with food, health, and financial assistance. Communicate with residents proactively that you are available to assist them and want to work with them to ensure that they remain housed. And when necessary and probable, offer discounted rental rate, rates or waive rent. And the section two um, spells out much of the same only for mortgage and lien holders of residential, commercial, and personal property. Um, this resolution also um, is an act of the mayor and commission to call on Governor Kemp to use emergency powers to impose an immediate moratorium on residential and commercial rent payments such that no Athenian should be required to pay rent during this health emergency or accumulate debt for unpaid rent, and to call on federal legislators and Pre President Trump's administration to impose an immediate moratorium on residential and commercial mortgage payments such that no owner, owner of Athens property should be required to pay mortgage payments during this health emergency or accumulate additional debt for unpaid, unpaid mortgage payments. As well, the mayor and commissioner of Athens Park County call on members of the United States Congress, specifically representatives Jody Heist, Doug Collins, and Financial Services Committee Chair Maxine Waters, and Senators David Perdue and Kelly Leffler, to impose an immediate moratorium on residential and commercial mortgage payments and rent such that no property owner in the nation should be required to pay mortgage during this health emergency or accumulate additional debt for unpaid mortgage payments. And no renter in the nation should be required to pay rent during this health emergency or accumulate debt for um, unpaid rent. Finally, the Mayor and Commissioner of Athens Park County called on President Trump to issue an executive order to impose an immediate moratorium on residential and commercial mortgage payments and rent, such that no owner of property in the nation should be required to pay mortgage during this health emergency or accumulate debt for unpaid mortgage payments, um, so on and so forth. So, um, in sum, what this resolution does is encourage compassion. It lays out a variety of options that landlords have at their disposal to work with their fellow Athenians to weather this crisis, and it shows a community that we are unified in supporting tenants in their current struggle, and it leverages our power as elected officials to influence those at the state and federal levels to take emergency actions that we as a local government cannot. Um, so that, in short, is what we are trying to do here, and we hope to have your support in doing so. I think you're muted, Kelly. The, um, so given the resolution that uh, you've just heard Commissioner Parker describe, the first order of business would be to amend tonight's agenda to consider this resolution. Uh, I make a motion. All right, I have a motion from Commissioner Denson to um, place this on the agenda for consideration. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll say second from Commissioner Link. Um, uh, any further discussion? I'll, I'll say a couple words about it. Um, I have heard from a couple landlords who have on the front end reached out to their tenants. One's a commercial landlord and one's a residential landlord and, and gotten creative with options on deferring rent payments, um, giving the option for folks to draw from their deposit to pay rent um massive discounts of rent waiving it um so i i want to encourage all those property owners out there to really reach deep in their heart and find some compassion and understand the crisis we're in we are all gonna have to sacrifice during this time there are plenty of us who are very very lucky myself concluded and we are able to work from home and draw a paycheck but there are so many out there who their source of income is completely gone and we understand that um, property owners who rely on rent, that is a source of income too. But, you know, we are in this together and we're all going to need to to find some sacrifice um, for the greater good and for the stability of our economy and our community. So I, I really want to encourage everybody out there who does draw an income from property ownership to be as creative and compassionate as possible 
in working with your tenants. All right. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Wright indicated uh, she wanted to make comment. Um, yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I, um, I appreciate that being read since that's the uh, first time I have heard the details of this. Um, I do agree that we all need to stay in this together and work in a cooperative way. Um, I think some of that could have been helpful for those of us who weren't the authors of this, and I, I am glad that you guys have spent time on that. We text each other about a lot of things uh, during all this, and a text letting us know that this was in process and when it would be uh, sent out uh, and include everybody to have a chance to read through it and to get uh, input from the community um, would have been helpful for me. Um, so I just wanted to say that on the front end of my objection to adding this is because of the lack of transparency in the process but yet I will be moving forward with our discussion of the actual content. So right now you're saying to vote, to put it on the agenda. Y yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right, and so I just wanted to be clear that um, I, I thought that this has maybe been in the works longer than when it was launched out to the mayor and commission uh, in the community in our official vehicle. So I just am expressing my frustration. I do want us to move together as a community together, and I will work together with everybody on the content, but I am not in favor of the process of getting it here. Um, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. And and I, I, I do understand that, that frustration, uh, Commissioner Wright, and, and just, I do also want to be transparent, and uh, Commissioner Parker and I did uh, work on this last night um, a lot of this is, uh, some of this language is, is built on the framework of what Seattle, Washington passed yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Um, so we're able to use some of that framework from theirs to kind of build and uh, make it fit for Athens. And also add the, uh, the first part, because um, I think there's kind of two parts to it here, which Commissioner Parker kind of, you know, I, I agree, says it's like a compassionate look which is compassionate encouragement to our landlords and to um, mortgage lien holders um, with some uh, recommendations that uh, many other organizations have, have shown uh, could really help alleviate some of the, um, some of the pressure, financial pressure that, that rent and mortgage payments are going to bring about over the next few months. And then of course, kind of the second part in which we're asking the state and the federal government to kind of step up into those powers that we don't have um, to have to take some major changes that I think are going to be uh, inevitable uh, to help everybody financially. And the, the reason that we are trying to push this through tonight um, is because uh, rent is due for literally <clears throat> tens of thousands of people, hundred, you know, tomorrow uh, on the first of the month. And if we were to wait through April 7th, uh, most landlords have a grace period of, of about seven days. So if we're doing this on April 7th, um, some of that damage is already going to be done. I'm not actually forcing anybody to do something here, but I think making some uh, compassionate encouragement for some policies to put, be put in place and to encourage the tenants and the <coughs> landlords and, uh, and also the, the, the mortgage holders and um, those paying their mortgages to kind of be able to come together. And I've heard similar references from um, our Chamber of Commerce for asking for the same kind of steps to be taken so that we can be working together here to move forward. Um, but as this situation, uh, COVID-19 has thrown at us, we definitely are not able necessarily to operate on the same schedules that we normally have, hence why we're doing this tonight, which is not at all a normal time for us to be meeting. Um, so I, uh, I, along with Commissioner Parker, I appreciate the, the flexibility <coughs> and the understanding in us moving forward to be able to vote on this tonight. Any other discussion uh, ahead of a uh, vote to place this on the agenda for tonight? Just, can I get some clarification? Yeah, Commissioner Wright. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. And, you know, maybe it, there's just a lot of built up frustration with everything that's going on. So we're going to vote to put it on the agenda, and then we're going to vote to accept the resolution. Those are the two steps we're adding to the work session. That, that's correct, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. 
Any other commission comment? All right, um, Clerk Spratlin, um, uh, if you could go ahead and uh, just do a roll call for placing this item on tonight's agenda as an amendment. Denson? Yes. Naismith? Yes. Edwards? Yes. Harrod? Harrod? I don't hear Harrod. Thornton? Yes. Thornton? Thornton? I don't hear Thornton. I, I, I unmuted her. I think she should be available now. Ovita? You, you unmute, uh, unmuted me? Yeah. Well, then yeah. you did not hear, then you did not get my signal, but I really wanted to make a comment. And I'm going to say yes because I need to um, voice my frustration with how this was presented. And, 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 and I'm really bothered by the fact, because I know this is gonna put me in a bad light with some folk, but when you come up with resolutions, they are not wishful thinking. We should have a process to help these people. This resolution would have been a lot stronger if we set aside money to help folk. Now, I keep doing these resolutions that are just good on paper, but doesn't help nobody. So, and we haven't talked to landlords. How do we do stuff like this? I'm going to vote yes, but I'm really, really kind of, I hate these last minute push-offs like the rest of us don't have any say-so or opinion. But I know how important it is. It sounds compassionate, but it was handled, it was actually handled wrong. And, um, but I hope that it will open the door for us to find some money, hard money to help these people and start talking to landlords. Now I'm going to vote yes, but that's my, that I couldn't get on earlier to say that. Thank you, Commissioner. Handy. Yes. Handy. Yeah. Yes. Forward. Yes. Parker. Blink. Yes. Right. Okay, I'm going to do yes. I'm coming into my cooperation mode. But I do want to make sure that you guys heard how frustrating this is during some very challenging times for us to be cooperative and this coming along the way it does. But um, let's just move together. Let's get this unity thing going. No, how about yes? Let's get it on the agenda. Let's, make, let's get some work done. That was 10 yes. Thank you, Clerk Spratlin. Um, any other commissioners uh, like to speak to just the substance of the resolution before the vote on the resolution itself? Uh, can you hear me, Kelly? Yeah, yes, Andy, we can hear you. I, I don't have any problem with the substance, but I agree with both what Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Thornton said. I, I don't like doing this when people surprise their colleagues with something. I mean, we got an email about this at about 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, some of us didn't have a chance to look at it until later on in the afternoon. And so my uh, my objections are not about the substance of it. My objections are about the process. It lacks transparency. And, you know, some of us are always talking about the need for transparency, except when it's convenient not to have it. Thank you, Commissioner. Can you hear me, Kelly? Y yes. Yeah, Commissioner. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I saw it on Facebook. But now it's formally um, presented it to us tonight. And that was the t email that I sent out. You know, we don't need to use bad situations to, to make a point. And like I said, I'm going to vote yes, because the next thing I'm going to recommend is that we find the dollars and local government to have some financial relief to some of these people who are facing evictions. I'm going to recommend that we talk to landlords and try to help them through this struggle. It, it, it was it was wrong um, because we put stuff on paper and don't put no money behind it. And it's wrong. It's wrong. But we need to help that lady um, that is facing eviction. We need to help a lot of people financially. That's what I would have appreciated us talking about. No money, but we put stuff on paper like it's a, a Christmas card. But yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. You open it up. Let's do this. Let's put some money in these pots 
to help these landlords and these tenants to avoid evictions. Let's pay these late fees. Let's pay these rent from the local government. Other commission input? Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Herod. Do you just want, so for the public that's listening or watching or however the public is consuming this meeting, did you want to maybe make a public statement about what um, Judge Barron has said about evictions? Uh, th thank you. I appreciate that note. Um, uh, right now through mid-April, Magistrate Court is not holding any eviction hearings at all. And um, you know, I fully anticipate that given the extension of this emergency period, uh, that same posture would be extended as well. So yeah, no, that, that that's that's an important note. So um, no hearings are going to magistrate court at all right now for eviction. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, I do support the substance of this resolution, but you know, a phone call goes a long way. And, uh, you know, in the future, when we sort of act in an emergency manner like this, a phone call to everybody on the commission, I, I think would certainly go a long way just to kind of bring it to everyone's attention, see if there's any questions on the front end, you know, make sure the, the questions are answered before the meeting, um, especially when something gets released the day of, you know, just a courtesy call uh, to me and, I'd be happy to make calls as well to, uh, you know, help get the information out there, make sure just checking their email so that they see something like this. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any other commission input before a vote on the substance of the, um, of the recommendation that uh, landlords offer grace to tenants? All right, uh, Clerk Spratlin, could you call the roll? Do you have a motion on the floor to adopt uh, it? I, I apologize. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'd accept a motion to adopt. I, I think Commissioner Parker just made a motion on mute, and I'll second that. All right. Yeah, I, I saw Commissioner Parker's uh, motion. Uh, lip reading skills are uh, getting stronger here in this uh, Zoom era. Uh, so we've got a motion from Commissioner Parker, a second from Commissioner Denson. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Parker. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Commissioner Harris. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be difficult. Are we voting to put this on the agenda for next Tuesday, and then we will vote to approve it or not then, or are we voting right now to approve it? We're, we're voting right now, sir. Okay. Do, do we have to make a special called meeting to vote? Uh, it, it's a it's a resolution rather than an ordinance uh. or a budget action, so. Uh, because it doesn't carry any sort of uh, force of permanence no at all. resolution. Apologize. I had a motion from Commissioner Parker, second from Commissioner Denson. I think Clerk Spratlin is call calling the roll. I have Parker. Link? Yes. Wright? Yes. Denson? Yes. Naismith? Naismith? He's on mute. Jerry, you need to unmute. Him. Yes. Edwards? Yes. Harrod? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Handy? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Hear me? All right. Well, yes. uh, thank you, Clerk Spratlin, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, I, I think, you know, we've all been <clears throat> in situations in the past where we've been financially strained and we know that's particularly true of so many members of our community right now and uh, we do ask for grace on the part of everyone in dealing with those who they have business relationships. Um, we're moving on now to the uh, athens Clark County Resiliency Package discussion. Um, there's going to be a presentation uh, from um, Manager Williams uh, with uh, some assistance from uh, J.W. Thaxton, who's our emergency manager. Um, we're going to stop a couple of times in the midst of it um, and um, and get some commission input. Uh, and so if you just uh, jot down any questions, commissioners, that you have, uh, the, the first stop will be kind of after we're done talking about the, um, the federal assistance, and then we'll stop 
uh, when we discuss uh, legal and financial considerations and then at the conclusion of the presentation too. So I'm going to go ahead and let Manager Williams kick it off. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, let me share my screen with you. Okay. Um, as you know, last Thursday, uh, you directed that uh, you ordered actually the manager to allocate up to $3 million by transferring funds from the prosperity package uh, for several purposes. And we'll discuss that briefly. Um, assisting community partners in providing emergency assistance to residents, assisting with small business continuity, assisting nonprofit community partners, providing essential services with response. And then in this uh, current state and after doing additional research on some of the um, ideas that some of you had and some of the uh, trying to canvas the nation, uh, investing in public safety enhancements as well as a second step. Um, I released a document on Friday evening, uh, this resiliency package, and in trying to, in, in brainstorming with staff looking at other programs across the nation, listening to your input, we came up with a number of things here uh, that we felt would be helpful to the community at this time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the legality of that in just a second. Uh, it's been a quick, uh, just under two weeks, or just, uh, just at two weeks now since uh, the World Health Organization declared this a pandemic. And there's been a number of declarations, including yours, uh, both on the uh, 16th and the 19th um, that, that helped to uh, get us to where we are today. Um, I think it's important because it's clear the intent of the mayor and commission is to support the community in the wake of this uh, unprecedented, unforeseen disaster. And uh, I think there's been a lot that's happened even in the week since we've last met regarding the types of state and federal disaster assistance that, that is becoming available. And not only for your, your benefit, but also those for the public that are viewing tonight, um, we wanted to, to walk you through uh, really two things. And I'm gonna ask Captain J.W. Thaxton of our fire department and our emergency management coordinator to do this. But basically in any disaster, there are certain types of, of aid that FEMA can make available based on the declarations by the state and federal governments. And then the, the Congress did take an extra step this past week uh, to uh, create the CARES Act. Act. And so we want to talk about both of those types of assistance uh, to give you additional context as we, we continue to search for ways to support the community, but also to educate the public on um, what's, what's out there and what could help them as well. So, Captain Thaxton, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Manager Williams. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, good deal. So yeah, like Manager Williams was saying, typically in a in a disaster response and the recovery effort, uh, state and federal assistance is provided in really three different areas. And keeping in mind there is a lot of crossover uh, in these areas, but the next slide will will talk us through the kind of the highlights. What I'm going to do is uh, talk through what we know some of the existing programs, some of the enhancements that have been made to those programs. And also, I just want to emphasize, this is new, um, and there's a lot of unknown uh, with some of the federal initiatives that are in play right now. So I was on a call this morning, or this afternoon, actually, uh, about recovery efforts in local communities. And, and the presenter made the point that traditionally, there's about 28 different funding mechanisms from the federal government during a disaster situation. Uh, and, and that is expanding greatly with this. So there is still some unknown, but what we're going to do is talk about what we know up to this point uh, in these three categories. So for businesses, and then I've, I've got a little caveat there with some nonprofits are eligible for assistance well, through the Small Business Administration. So the federal government's primary arm for providing assistance to the business community is through the Small Business Administration. Uh, that has been enhanced recently with the CARES Act. There's some additional funding that's been applied to that, and we'll talk through that in just a few minutes. Uh, for individuals uh, and then some nonprofit organizations, there's a lot of things in play 
one of which is the USDA has provided some additional funding uh, through Georgia DFAC uh, for some uh, who are receiving uh, those benefits. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, this act uh, provides eligible employees um, up to two weeks of paid time off uh, for sickness, for self-quarantine, for isolation measures related to COVID-19. It also provides up to two weeks of paid time off uh, at two-thirds of their pay care for a family member or a child who's schools. Uh, additionally, we'll, we'll get into the details of, or some of the details of the CARES Act, but uh, it's going to provide things like direct cash payments that we've all seen in the news, um, extra and expanded unemployment benefits, and mortgage relief from homeowners as well. And then FEMA's individual assistance is still somewhat unknown, and I'll talk through that in just a minute. Uh, but for the local government, the primary funding mechanism is uh, the FEMA's public assistance program. Um, idea where we're at with that. Governor Kemp has uh, requested a public assistance and an individual assistance declaration. We've been approved for the public assistance declaration, uh, so that means reimbursement uh, will be possible for the local government's expense uh, related to. But I think it's important to point out that the state and federal assistance programs that are out there, um, they're designed to be uh, administered to the, directly to the business or directly to the individual, and in our case, directly to the local government. In other words, if, if we provide uh, benefits from the local government, they're not going to be reimbursable under FEMA's public assistance program, and we can talk through some of that in just the next slide. So the SBA funds are available now. Um, one new program is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it appears that the funding was provided through the CARES Act for that. Uh, that provides small businesses up to $10 million uh, for associated with payroll. Uh, it's important to note that payroll, rent, mortgage interest, utilities uh, are all 100% forgivable um, with this program. Also, the economic injury disaster loans. This program has been a while in, in play for a while, um, but specific to this event, businesses can apply for a loan advance up to ten thousand uh, dollars for a quick um, emergency relief, and that loan program will provide up to two million dollars in low interest loan um, for debt relief. Businesses that have a SBA loan currently, uh, they're uh, suspending payments for six months. And then there's also a Freddie Green program where businesses that have a pre-existing relationship with the SBA can uh, apply for an express loan up to $25,000 and have that turned around in just a few days. So the primary mechanism for federal assistance for businesses is the SBA, uh, and that their efforts have been enhanced with some recent legislation. So that's available now for people's uh, for business applications. We can move. All right. Uh, so the public assistance program, again, uh, the governor requested this. FEMA approved it actually Sunday. Uh, these bullet points here are some of the categories of assistance um, that we could uh, be reimbursed for. And the breakdown of that is there's a 75% cost share on the federal government. And typically, it's a 12.5% split between the local and the state of Georgia. Um, now, FEMA does have the ability to increase their cost share, as, as does the state of Georgia, but typically the split would look something like this. Uh, so the activities that we're taking part of within the local government, um, we will be able to apply for reimbursement uh, for many of those activities. So the individual assistance program, uh, the Governor Kemp has requested FEMA's individual assistance program. Uh, it's pending approval right now, but if approved, these are some of the different uh, types of activities that could be approved. Now, keep in mind, uh, we may be approved for one area, such as disaster legal services, but not be approved for, say, crisis counseling. So some of this is still unknown, but the request is out there, and uh, we're seeing states start to get approved for the individual assistance program. Again, it's important to note the services and the assistance provided through the IA program 
is the federal government working directly with the individual. Our role in this would be to help facilitate um, getting getting our residents to uh, FEMA to perform the documentation. So as mentioned, uh, the CARES Act has kind of increased uh, some of our traditional uh, disaster funds uh, with, like we talked about, the FBA emergency grants, the $10,000 grants, uh, forgivable loans for certain expenses, and the relief for existing loans. Um, with the individual assistance, I think we've all seen uh, there's going to be direct cash payments, and that's going to be tiered based on income. But just as an example, a family of four with an income of less than $150,000 could expect to see about $3,400 in cash payment. Um, also, with our unemployment benefits, uh, there's going to be $600 added per week to the benefit uh, unemployment benefit, and also it's going to add 13 weeks uh, in duration to that. There's also a new special, uh, and it's going to be a temporary pandemic unemployment assistance program that will be for folks that would traditionally not be eligible for unemployment insurance, such as entrepreneurs, freelancers, and, and those type of workers. Uh, there's mortgage relief. There's $8.8 .8 billion provided to schools to increase their ability to provide meals for children, uh, $15.5 billion to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and then about $450 million earmarked for food banks and commodity food distribution programs uh, within communities. And then as far as the local government, what we can expect, um, the CARES Act provided additional funding for the public assistance program, so there will be more money there available. Uh, there's also uh, assistance for the transit system. So they'll have a, the FDA will administer the uh, reimbursement funds for transit, and there's also uh, some more community development block grants coming in the area of $5 billion applied to that. So this just kind of speaks to some of the details that we really just discussed. Um, uh, like I said, forgivable loans from the SBA, um, individual relief in the form of cash payments uh, that will be coming, mortgage relief, and then the community development block grant. Thank you, Captain Daxton. Uh, Mayor, I'll turn yes. it to you for any questions. Thanks. Let's go ahead and um, stop here, just since we're talking about state and federal supports. I uh, certainly want to see everyone in Athens avail themselves most completely of these supports. You know, we know that historically some of our challenges um, with the kind of community population dynamics that we have are that existing ongoing programs like SNAP and WIC uh, haven't been fully accessed by people who can. Uh, I know in some of the email traffic that I've seen, you know, there's been interest in ensuring that our neighborhood leaders are um, some of the frontline force that just make sure that everybody in the community knows, particularly that these individual opportunities exist. And I've uh, been in many conversations with small business people and the Chamber of Commerce who are uh, ensuring that the business community is aware of those business supports, particularly the opportunity to have fully forgivable loans for eight weeks of payroll and rent and utility payments and mortgage interest. Um, I, I'm gonna run down uh, the commissioners and I know it uh, feels a little bit stilted, but because I can't see everybody, um, I'll just start. Commissioner Davenport, any questions so far? <laughs> Commissioner Parker, any questions? Yes, I, ha I have a couple. Um, I'm just curious, I guess, broadly about the way that these resources made available under the CARES Act might synthesize with efforts that we do locally. For example, could community food dist distribution resources available under the CARES Act be brought to bear on our current food distribution efforts through CCSD or new programs like uh, the Victory Gardens program that was suggested by the manager's office? Manager Williams or JW? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yes, sir. I'll comment on it. So we'd have to we'd have to research that specifically um, to to see where that funding is coming from and who it's applicable to. Um, I'll certainly, get back to you on that. Okay, great. There is funding earmarked. 
there is funding earmarked for that purpose, so we can we can do some research and get back to you on that. Okay, I'm really curious if it could be used to support uh, CSAs or some sort of program like that to help people get fresh fruit food. Similarly, along those lines, I was wondering if CDBG grants will be dispersed uh, in accordance with our current methods with regards to restrictions and the processes internal to ACC that we use to decide how those funds are allocated. We have not decided that yet. We're, we're still waiting for that to be forthcoming. Okay. And lastly, on a slightly different vein, and this kind of encompasses some stuff that we have to some, some to do with like the Small Business Administration. And um, it's keeping in mind conversations we had about making information available to small business owners and folks experiencing unemployment right now, I wondered if we could talk some about uh, resources we can put towards informing folks about fraud and eligibility for unemployment and these various kinds of loans and grants available through SBA. Yes, great question, Commissioner. And uh, I can tell you the Chamber's already been uh, pinging us uh, today on, on how to best partner to do that. And we do have, um, um, Ilka McConnell will be starting uh, tomorrow as our new Economic Development Director. And, and our intent with regards to state and federal assistance is to try to uh, be the, the awareness link for our citizens to know where to go, what to do, try, try to leverage as much federal assistance as we can in this community. Okay, are there, I, uh, and I may have seen this previously and forgot the specific details of it, but are we planning on making available on our webpage or through other channels some Absolutely. information about how people can get connected with these resources? Yes, yes, we're going to have, we can We can come up with a, um, a dedicated page that talks about federal benefits, but as you can see, it's, it's, it's a, there's a whole bunch for the average person to sort through. I will sure. tell you with respect to small business, um, we do have, um, well, let's, let's stay with what you're talking about. So we do have the neighborhood leaders who we hope will spread the news of what's available out there through their networks. Um, when it comes to small business, we, uh, we've got uh, an inventory, if you will, of all the folks that have paid an occupational tax certificate, um, and we will, they've gotten their occupational tax certificate, so we, we plan to comprise an email out to them with links that can get on them directly to this, uh, this relief. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna move through the whole commission, Commissioner Link. Um. Yeah, I'm curious about the timeline for this relief from the feds. Um, you know, there are people who have already missed their first paycheck and rents due tomorrow. Um, what is the timeline for this kind of relief? You know, regardless of, of whether or not somebody can apply for it, how long will it take to get here? Uh, I, yeah, no, I was, I was waiting to see if Captain Thaxon... My understanding is, uh, and this is only through the chamber just today, um, in emails that we're going back and forth, but it could be as early as 72 hours once you've got an application in uh, uh, for the businesses. Um, so we're learning more about how quick that is, but I'm like you, Commissioner. I was, uh, up until the last day or so, I was wondering if this was going to be weeks in the making, but it, it seems that it's going to be much quicker than that. Um, and, and Captain Thaxon, I'll defer to you or anybody else that has any further knowledge. I have a, I have a yeah, I, Go ahead. Sorry. I just think every piece to what we've described is going to be a little bit different timeline. Um, so the SBA uh, applications and the funding is there now, and I, I think that's right. I'm seeing 72 hours can, could be the earliest. Uh, and then when you get to public assistance funding, you know, that's going to be – uh, months down the road before we're reimbursed, but that's the local government expense. And, you know, some of the, the stuff that we talked about for the individual, well, the FEMA uh, IA assistance, has, the program hasn't even been approved yet, so it is a little ways out. Um, but some of the stuff up under the CARES Act, uh, the timeline on that, we're, we're not 100% sure on. But every little piece to it is going to be a little bit different. And it's also my understanding that through the CARES Act, everyone, whether or not you're still drawing an income, will be getting a $1,200 check. Um, so is there any, I, I honestly would like to see us 
has some kind of resolution or encouragement for folks Stop this damn resolution. who don't well i'm just putting this out there so we can talk about it um for folks to if you if you are drawing your regular paycheck you don't necessarily need that twelve hundred dollars if we can set up a fund or maybe do it through the community foundation to donate that money and and get it out as quickly as possible to people who do need it who are because twelve hundred dollars isn't going to help you many people much at all if you don't have a job period um it's barely going to get you by so i just want to put that out there on the front end because all of us are going to be seeing some kind of relief from this whether or not we actually need it um and yeah i'm glad you mentioned the uh, the occupation tax list because I, I think that's a valuable way to get information directly to businesses and i'd like to see us mail that information as well as send an email any further questions commissioner link i think that's it for now okay All right, uh, commissioner wright thank can you hear me okay yep um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Parker covered a lot of what I was wanting to uh, ask about, and that is making sure that our website uh, does become uh, or the link between the information that's coming to state and federal level so that we can direct folks. I think that's what she was coming at, and I just wanted to be sure that the community understands and that when we get inquiries, we can direct them to our website for further information that is coming from the staff. And I also am appreciating with each thing that we get, the 27 page document we got Friday, the PowerPoint, if all this can stay on the website um, as long as possible so that it can be referred back to some of it's larger than we can mail to email to people. Um, how, lo will this, how long will this information be up after the over we can we can leave it up um until you know this is abated to some degree yeah. Um, yeah. until until it becomes um till the, with more information it can also obviously be embellished too i guess as more information comes but i feel that um this information it's gonna it's gonna take a while to get it out and i appreciate what is happening to get it out with the people we can connect to but there's a lot of people that are going to be reaching out to us that haven't connected yet and uh, i think that the neighborhood leaders are going to help with that but it, it, that'll help us communicate back um and then to clarify the next steps of, of this as a work session for what happens on tuesday well if when we get through all the way through the presentation then i think you it'll become apparent um okay. especially when we get to the the legal implications of what's being proposed okay and then for viewers who maybe aren't staying with this whole work session this will be a um, archive reviewable meeting as soon as it's over that's or, right okay okay all right thanks for clarifying that and um i'll go back to mute now commissioner denson thank you mayor um really just had uh one point, I guess a question first is to make sure that information I'm getting is correct. But when we talk about all of this uh, federal funding that um, is going to be coming down, also the state funding, including the unemployment stuff, my understanding here is that um, undocumented residents, residents who lack documentation, um, are not going to be able to actually receive any of that funds, the $1,200 check, unemployment none of that's actually going to be going to folks who lack documentation is that correct i believe that's correct okay and uh so so with that information i think it's really integral that we find ways with our own local funding we have here to make sure that we're using uh some of that in, in, in somewhat of an equitable fashion to make sure that we are help, uh, hoping out uh, those individuals. Um, I got some information uh, this week with a rough estimate that we have 3,200 households um, with undocumented um, adults in that, in that household. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a decent percentage of, of our population here. 
And that's a decent percentage that's not going to be getting any kind of economic relief through these other funds. So I think it's, it's absolutely paramount that uh, we find creative ways that we can make sure that the $3 million to the prosperity funds plus other things that we're doing here um, are able to, uh, some of that relief is able to find their way to those individuals. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Neesmith? Yes, thank you. I think most of my, well, I have a thousand questions as we all do about this very complex uh, CARES legislation. Uh, but uh, along the lines of uh, what Commissioner Jensen was saying, I, I, I want to encourage uh, our nonprofits and our churches to reach out to our, our undocumented uh, families with undocumented adults and and help them out as best they can. And I, I know some of them are, but I think that's uh, that's where that's where that, those are the ones that can react now and, and can react most effective and, and most uh, appropriate. That's all. Commissioner Edwards. Yes, I would like to uh, reiterate what Commissioner Barker asked about the federal assistance for emergency food, because I know that the East Athens Development Corporation is currently operating an, an emergency food pickup. And um, I, I gave a contribution. I know some other people have on the commission as well. So um, it would be nice to hook hook those uh, local partners who are already acting up with the federal funding. Um, I had one question about the SBA for local businesses. Um, is that a, a, how long will that funding last? That's, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer. Um, there's obviously a lot of need right now. There's a lot of money that's been poured to the SBA, but uh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. How much? How much is available now through that program? I'm trying to add up right now. One second. I guess the point I'm making is 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 it your understanding that time is of the essence for local businesses in Athens to apply for that grant or that loan that can be forgiven? Well, I would I would say so just from a business continuity standpoint. Okay. Just wanted to stress that. Thank you. Carry on. Uh, Commissioner Harrod. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, so I, I guess just a couple of things. One, um, I thought the report that uh, the manager's office produced and gave us um, on Friday was uh, was really well done, and um, obviously a lot of work had gone into that, so kudos there. Um, a second thing I wanted to say, just just a correction, because I think with, with the public watching, I think it's really important that we get our facts straight, and, and Commissioner Link mentioned that everybody is going to be getting a $1,200 check, and that's, my understanding, that's not entirely correct. So I don't want to create a false expectation out there um that that's that's the case um and then the you, third one go ahead that, that's right commissioner harrod uh, those checks winnow um i think as you move above seventy five thousand dollar income yes. for an individual yeah and, and obviously the, the the aim is to help people of more modest means and i think that's correct but i i just i think we need to not set up false expectations i remember um, in the 2008 when there was discussion about, well, everybody's going to get a $600 check from the federal government, and that was not the case. So I just want, we need to be, we need to be very precise in what we're saying in a public medium. Um, but the other question I, I had, excuse me, and this is going back to the manager's um, uh, document that he provided the, uh, on Friday. So on page six, at the very top, um, it says, all programs except FEMA's public assistance program are administered directly to the recipient, business, nonprofit, or individual. Therefore, ACCGov should not expect reimbursements for any support it provides to individuals, businesses, or nonprofit organizations. And so my, my question is, um, is uh, obviously that's, 
you know, how much we may or may not get reimbursed by the federal government is going to shape to a certain degree how much local money we reasonably have to be able to um, utilize as part of a local emergency. So I was wondering if maybe the the manager could just, you know, for the, for the benefit of people who are, are watching who haven't had a lot of time to look at these figures, maybe could you just kind of maybe re-emphasize or go into a little bit more detail about what we may or may not uh, be reimbursed by the federal government for? Sure. I, I'll, I'll briefly respond and offer uh, Captain Thaxon uh, the same opportunity, uh, Commissioner. And I think this also goes into some discussion we're going to have about the legality of, of us as a local government. But um, the individual assistance program, which Captain Thaxon covered, you know, is administered directly to the recipient. I've got the public assistance slide up here. You know, there are things that we can do to support the community that are not directly um, given to someone. Uh, and there are some state constraints on that we'll discuss here. So what you see in front of you are some things that we could provide that would be reimbursable uh, to some degree. Um, but any some of the things that that we have uh, suggested in the resiliency package would not be eligible for federal reimbursement. Uh, as we understand it. Captain Thaxton? Yes, sir, that, that's correct. So the federal and state assistance programs are designed to work directly with the recipient, that being the business, a nonprofit organization, or the individual uh, themselves. It, local governments do not play a role in filtering that money or applying for reimbursement. The only activities that we would be reimbursed for are local government activities uh, that fall in one of those categories under public assistance. That answer your question. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. I, I, as I say, I think it's you know, as as decision makers, we've got to you know, we've got to juggle several balls at, at one time. And obviously, you know, the less money we get from the federal government, we do have certain budgetary realities here locally. I mean, we are a local government after all. And obviously, the less government we get, the less money we get from the federal government, that that you know constrains us in some ways. Obviously, the more we can get from the feds, then that provides us with greater opportunities to use some of our local dollars in ways that we don't have to if we're getting money from the feds. That that's just the point. Thanks, Commissioner. Andy, any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Thornton. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I I also think that uh, the manager's report was was excellent, and I really commend the the time and the energy that his office has put into the report. Um, I want to make sure and. Uh, the manager and I have already talked about this, is to make sure we include the neighborhood leaders in all of our community outreach effort. Um, they have already, they're already in our budget. And I think this is a good way that we can utilize their services and uh, expertise in the community. Um, I looked at the, um, information about small businesses. I do know I've spoken to uh, Linda Ford today and she's trying to make sense out of all the federal regula regulations and I referred her to the director of the North uh, the Northeast Business Alliance, Shane Blackwell, because when things trickle down from the federal government down to the local government, most, most of the time, if not all of the time, there are a group of people who are left out. By the time we figure it out, <clears throat> that train has left the station. I think that using community people to help get the word out uh, to those small businesses that are, are traditionally not included is very important. So I want to commend Linda for it. I don't know if this is part of her job description 
but I do know she's working with the chamber. I do know that I have already referred 10 businesses to her just for information, let, just letting them be alert. I think we as commissioners, it's easy for us to tell other people what to do. Um, but, you know, we got to roll up our sleeves and help get the information out also. Um, I do have a concern while all, and, and, you know, I didn't know I could do resolutions and make statements, you know, in the 11th hour, but I do have a concern that um, many of our, 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 our families that are working, they did not get the EBT food stamp increase like other families. So you have folk out here working, they do not have that um, ability or did not get that ultimate amount through their EBT cards. I do want to put on the manager's um, radar We've got to make sure we include low those those families that are working every day, but are struggling with minimal wages or very short hours. <laughs> so um, I want to put that on your radar, and I do know that the manager had created the, uh, and we've talked about this. Um, the structure he's using of his staff, which I think is is good. I think it's fantastic. But I hope we can get to a place that those uh, areas, I think it's operational, administrative, and communications. I hope that we get to a place where each of those um, uh, areas are working with those folk who are actually boots on the ground that know this stuff. We've talked about it and I think we're going to get there. Uh, I do want to close by saying I have no questions. Um, I, uh, I do want to speak for those uh, folk that are working and dealing with low in uh, wages and did not get that um, food stamp increase like others did. And we need to keep them under our radar. Um, but I'm real pleased in the direction that we're heading from people that I'm talking in other counties. We are so far ahead of the curve. Um, I know people want to pick it apart and I know other people want to grand slant stand some of, of the crises, but we are so far ahead of the curve. And I want this, um, this county to know that I'm full support. I'm on board, um, and we 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 can get through this. Thanks, Commissioner, and uh, um, I agree with so much of what you said. I do want to highlight that um, the Downtown Development Authority, who you referenced, has done a great job reaching out to those that are in their district and provided about ninety thousand dollars of support to uh, more than eighty businesses. So, um, lots of work underway here already. Uh, Commissioner Harris, uh, Hamby, I'm sorry. Hamby, I'm, I'm last and you can't, I'm last and you can't get my name right. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I think a lot of people uh, have spoken about what I would like to see as far as uh, getting the information out there uh, and making sure that, that businesses and individuals alike are, are aware of what the care program uh, entails and what it what it offers i noticed also the cdbg and i guess what i'm wondering is um out of the monies that they will be offering for communities for cdbg maybe try to figure out what uh, what level of, uh, we should be expecting here in athens and maybe even having us take a take, i know we're voting on cdbg stuff on the 7th so i don't know if it's worth taking a second look at, at our recommendations to see uh, to see what could be done uh within that program uh that and i don't know if you could use cdbg money or not for rent assistance like uh, commissioner thornton was talking about uh but um but taking a look at the current and future cdbg and maybe maybe finding out what that what that five 
five, uh, I think it was a $5 billion they said they were going to be offering in CDBG support for, for communities. How much of that uh, Athens could expect to see? Yes, sir. So it was $5 I'm, billion. I'm dollars. It is $5 billion. Did everybody uh, hear all that? Yes, sir. Yep. It was you hear five the part about looking at the... Did you hear the part about looking at the existing CDBG? Yes, sir. Um, and and that we could push that decision, you know, for another month. Um, that the, the CDBG allocations have not been made. We don't know how much Athens Park County will get, and I'm not not sure of the timeline that we'll ultimately find out about that. Um, so um, we can and I can share with you the timeline for getting this current CDBG of fund allocation approved. Uh, per the HUD guidelines or requirements. I think we got right. a little less than 60 days. This, uh, this supplemental CDBG allocation through the CARES Act, um, as a couple folks have noted, totals $5 billion for the entire nation. And just to give you a comparison, uh, in the last couple of years, typically it's been about 3.3 .3 or 3.4 billion for the entire nation. Um, and so if the allocation is proportionate in the way that um, the normal one is, that may mean that we receive about one and a half times in this special allocation what we normally get in one of the annual allocations. So um, that could mean somewhere, if, if this holds true, and again, that's a big if, somewhere around uh, 1.8 or $2 million. And of course, and, all and this Mayor, federal could programs. You, could you have, and Mayor, Mayor, I'm sorry, Mike. Could you say that again? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, um, I was wondering if the manager and and, and you could look at seeing if uh, if uh, the exist what we're what we're going to be voting on in April plus whatever supplemental, uh, if we could, uh, could we look at whether or not some, some sort of rent assistance like Commissioner Thornton was talking about would be available, if it's if it's allowable under HUD guidelines? We could certainly take a look at that. Did you get that? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. All right, we're gonna go ahead and um, move on to the next component, which is just the legal and financial considerations that have to be considered with any ACC Gov assistance. So uh, I'll turn that over to um, Manager Williams, and I think Attorney Drake may uh, provide a little bit of context here as well. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, because there's been some recent um, attorney insight on the revolving loan fund and direct assistance to individuals, uh, I'm going to skip those for the time being and call on Attorney Drake here in just a minute. Uh, I will speak very briefly to the Public Utilities Enterprise Fund and bond covenants, as well as special purpose local option sales tax. Those are things that, um, and, and, and let me also say this to the commission and uh, the viewing public. Uh, it, it's very clear the intent of the mayor and commission to support the community very swiftly in this, uh, during this crisis. Uh, and I think everybody had the same idea in mind that, that that the local government, the unified government, would need to step in and provide a bridge to ultimate state and federal assistance and uh, fill any gaps that, that um, the state and federal assistance would not help. Uh, and certainly, you know, two and a half weeks ago, as we all returned from spring break, would never have imagined that the federal government could have passed a tr $2 trillion bill uh, as quickly as it did uh, within these couple of weeks. Um, it was suggested uh, by commissioners who had uh, come up with a lot of ideas about how to how to support the community with our public utilities fund. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, as we'll talk about here, uh, a way that staff and public utilities department feels like it can uh, give some relief to the community uh, through reducing a, a certain rate. Um, with regards to the enterprise fund in general, uh, just so for the for the viewing public's purposes, um, an enterprise fund is different from our general fund. General fund holds taxpayer dollars, uh, people that pay property taxes, our sales tax. Um, an enterprise fund is where uh, 
fees are charged for goods and services. And of course, in this case, uh, water and sewer, uh, that the rate payers, uh, the person that has an account with the public utilities department is considered a rate payer. It pays rates to receive water and sewer bills, uh, water and sewer goods. About a decade ago, this mayor and commission, including some sitting commissioners, um, saw the need to reinvest in our um, public uh, utilities infrastructure. And it's, and it's quite amazing to think that uh, if you were to take all of the pipes out of the ground for all of our water and sewer, as well as our three water reclamation facilities and our drinking water system, that that would represent almost $2 billion of investment. And that is something that uh, we've heard about the infrastructure crisis across America and this government, the elected officials now and before us have done a good job of budgeting funds to reinvest in the replacement of those um, of that infrastructure. And in so doing, and a reason I, I mentioned that is it's such a it's a huge cost that oftentimes in order to make any uh, major uh, reinvestment that it's, it's necessary to borrow funds. And that's done through revenue bonds. So the Public Utilities Department, through the Unified Government, through the Mayor and Commission, uh, about, oh, I guess, almost 12 years ago now, uh, borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars to um, upgrade our water reclamation facilities and drinking water uh, plant. And when they do sell those revenue bonds, the institutions and individuals that buy those revenue bonds, uh, there are bond covenants, there's a bond ordinance, and uh, these are investors. Uh, they, they, they are giving money with the, uh, some return in the form of an interest rate. And there, and there is an agreement between the enterprise, public utilities department, and these institutional investors. And, and, and I'm, it's in the document if, if folks want to dig a little deeper. But suffice it to say, there are certain uh, things that uh, are controlled by that, uh, as in no free services. Um, there, you know, if we were to do that, we could we could only do that with nonprofit and governmental users in the time of emergency. And then, um, you know, that and again, it's not insidious. It's just that the investors are wanting to know that they, they have some certainty in getting their, uh, their the funds returned to them. So uh, it is somewhat restrictive, and we we've, we've laid that out there. But I will say that I think I want to public utility staff heard the mayor and commission's intent. Uh, they found a different way to get there to share uh, some fees back or some revenues or forego some revenues back with the, um, the public. Uh, and, and just to save us a slide later on, um, well, well, we'll get to it when we get there. The other thing, and I, and I heard this uh, a great deal from commissioners because there's a lot of, I mean, there's so much for folks to understand and the special purpose local option sales tax is something that a lot of uh, citizens are aware of, residents are aware of. Uh, they don't necessarily know perhaps the laws that support that. It's one of our higher, um, visibly higher uh, revenues that folks are aware of because we, we have a very public process when we go about uh, passing a SPLOS and of course the citizens are directly responsible for that. But the way that Georgia law uh, sets up the SPLOS is the sales tax proceeds only used to fund capital improvement projects that would have otherwise been paid for with general fund and property tax revenues. Uh, and, and, and as y'all all can, uh, as people can appreciate some of the, the bigger ticket items, uh, you know, the SPLOS 2020 is $300 million over um, 11 years, uh, 330 million. So that's about $30 million a year, which is well over quarter uh, or right about a quarter of our operating every year so that that just provides a jump start in capital investment that we otherwise really couldn't carry with our operating budget that being said georgia law uh, a can only be spent on projects that were specifically approved by the voters and it does not allow and this goes for SPLOST and t SPLOST, to pay for any operational or maintenance maintenance activities or any other general fund expenditure purpose, even in emergency situations. So to hire folks to, to, to pay for a new program, these are things that we cannot use SPLOS for. It can be used for 
capital projects that were previously approved by the voters. And that's currently how Georgia law sits. So those are two things that are pretty constant and that, that I'm familiar with. I do, uh, before handing over to Attorney Drake, I do want to point out that the commission, again, was being very, uh, was responding very quickly to needs that they could foresee in, in such a pandemic. Um, and, and I think pushed us to do, uh, to explore avenues of assistance that we've not previously done before. And I, and I applaud that. Uh, but in so doing this week, and I, and I appreciate um, the, the words that, that some of the commissioners shared about the work product, and certainly uh, that is a product of the staff uh, here that's working closely with us. We are learning as we go. And uh, I'm going to ask Attorney Drake to talk a little bit about the expiration of local government's um, potential assistance with revolving loan fund and direct assistance to individuals. And I also want to say we did canvas the nation and we found examples uh, that that while they may work in certain other states, may not be legal here. And so, Attorney Drake, I'll, I'll call on you now, please, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking the mayor and commission uh, for the opportunity to work with you during this uh, very trying and difficult time. Uh, I want to thank you for your questions and your uh, advocacy on behalf of the citizens and trying to get answers to questions. And I want to thank my staff for their hard work uh, over the last two weeks uh, during this time as well. And as well as recognize the commander's office and, and the rest of the staff, the unified government. I can tell you uh, they have been working very, very hard in support of this community. Uh, as the mayor and commissioner are aware, our office uh, has pro uh, provided uh, two detailed memorandums of law uh, related to uh, uh, the use of funds in a, in a proposed resiliency package. And I too commend the mayor commission on, the, on their efforts to, to bridge the gap uh, for the citizens of this community related to financial needs. I will say it's, uh, as you know, that things have changed daily and it's very amazing how quickly uh, the, the, the federal government was able to respond uh, last Friday in adopting uh, a $2 trillion relief package uh, that uh, we hope will bring uh, the needed financial relief and comfort to the community. Uh, the first memorandum uh, that was prepared as addressed was prepared by Dan McRae. Mr. McRae is an attorney who specializes in development authorities law because one of the requests of the mayor and commission was to set up a revolving loan fund that would allow for assistance uh, to directly assistance to bid local small businesses. Uh, Mr. McRae uh, actually altered that memorandum and I sent it out to the mayor and commission. But uh, in, in essence, what Mr. McRae uh, states is that at this point, he thinks it, it, that it will be very challenging uh, to, to utilize the development authority uh, to provide a revolving loan fund for small businesses. Uh, he is continuing to look at this matter and uh, he, he has not foreclosed the possibility entirely, but I think it's important for the mayor commission to understand that uh, uh, that that uh, there there are some challenges under Georgia law to setting up a revolving loan fund, even when one uses a development authority. Uh, we, we are uh, continuing to research that. We even had he, Mr. McCray, has sent an email today saying he has another idea to consider. I know the commissioner wants us to be creative and to be. Uh, expand all possibilities and that's what we're doing uh so we continue to look at that but i, I can say at this point uh we need to proceed cautiously before impl implementing a revolving loan fund for small businesses uh it is important to note as the manager did as things change daily you know uh, we, we are hopeful that the the cares act that's been enacted on the federal level will provide a lot of that needed uh, uh support for our local businesses and that we can direct our funds to other things that, that are certainly within our purview to spend, but uh, that is the guidance related to the revolving loan fund that we've had at this point, and we continue to look at that. Uh, the other issue that was requested by the mayor and commission was for uh, with the manager to look at direct assistance to individuals. And there are, uh, uh, our office prepared another memorandum related to this matter, which was provided to the mayor and commission. It's very detailed. But in summary, uh, it's important for you to know that 
just like with the SPLOST, uh, there are significant barriers to a local government's authority to provide financial assistance in times of crisis. Uh, under the Georgia Emergency Act, and man, under the Georgia Emergency Act, uh, a section of, the act, of that act specifically prohibits grants for the purposes of addressing welfare concerns for those affected by disaster unless it's done in conjunction with the disbursement of matching federal funds. Now it's important to note, as has been spoken uh, to earlier, that there is going to be a large uh, uh, amount of federal funds released uh, to the state of Georgia, and we anticipate that some of that can flow down to a local level, and, and there may be a possibility there to match some of those funds, but we still haven't received that guidance. And, and what that brings to mind is, as this thing evolves so quickly, we need to be patient. Uh, I would advise patience in the Parmaid Commission to the extent possible. Uh, while we know the needs are urgent, uh, but things are, evol are evolving on a quick basis and we may find an avenue that will allow us to match those funds and use it uh, as we get additional guidance. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the other concerns we, we have to be aware of is uh, the gratuities clause of the Georgia Constitution, uh, which prevents grants or gifts of funds by local government. In most cases, even when the intentions of the gift are charitable, Unless the gratuity falls with one of, one of three exceptions under that constitutional provision. One exception under the gratuity clause that would possibly support financial support being provided by the unified government to the public and or affected businesses is the third exception regarding substantial public benefits. That is where there is a substantial public benefit that, that flows from the assistance. However, there is a limited case law and that limited case law that is available related to the third exception has only ever been used to justify actions that were specifically authorized by state law. That's important to note because, you know, other local governments are considering the same issues that we are. And in, in talking with other local government attorneys around the state, there's even an anticipation that there could possibly be some legislative action on a statewide level coming forward to authorize some, uh, some of these things, but that hasn't, uh, that hasn't uh, transpired yet. That would be a, a great benefit if we had some specific legislative authority uh, related to, the, to this pandemic, providing financial assistance. Uh, there is also a third exception under the uh, gratuities clause that uh, that might justify uh, a, a local program for providing uh, financial assistance. Uh, programs designed specifically to provide indigent assistance uh, particularly as it relates to medical care or testing, are, are, are very much likely to be approved uh, under this section, second exception to the gratuities clause, which relates to support being provided for public welfare, but such a program would have to be evaluated carefully to ensure that it is constitutional. You know, in summary, I'm, I think it's clear that just providing a lump sum of money to a nonprofit without appropriate guidance and understanding of the purpose of the expenditures might surely be struck, that struck down a challenge as a violation of the, either the Georgia Emergency Management Act or the Tootie's Clause. Any program proposed uh, to be adopted as part of, the, of, of uh, providing financial assistance during this crisis, even one which attempts to utilize an independent nonprofit agency as a means of providing financial support will need to be individually analyzed and guidelines must be clearly established governing the expenditure of our general funds uh, before I would recommend that the mayor and commission adopt any such program to allow uh, funds to be dispensed. And what I mean by that is we need to, there would need to be very specific guidelines that those funds are being provided for, uh, to provide for uh, uh, indigent assistance, homeless assistance, uh, assistance uh, that, is, uh, that is authorized under the law. Uh, I uh, want to say that our office continues to, to research these issues. Uh, we've also asked Mr. McCray if he would take a look at our research and the memorandum I provided you related to uh, the, the individual assistance, and uh, hopefully he'll uh, be providing some additional guidance soon. But uh, we, uh, again, want to say that uh, we do think there are things that can be done successfully, uh, but there. Uh, but perhaps not as broadly as was initially contemplated by, by the mayor and commission. Uh, and we need to uh, be vigilant and seeking ways to do uh, things, but also be mindful that uh, uh, we, we, 
we uh, have to be mindful that we have to do things in a legally appropriate manner uh, to avoid legal challenge. Thank you, Attorney Drake. I appreciate that. And thank you, Manager Williams. Uh, or did either of you, Manager Williams or Attorney Drake, uh, have any more before I get to questions? All right. Yes, um, you know, and, and I'll say, you know, it's clear that some of the elements that we've contemplated uh, need some refinement to kind of pass that legal bar or in some cases may require some of that statewide uh, enabling legislation. Um, but what's fortunate is that many of the things contemplated certainly can go ahead um, and, and we're going to get to those in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'll go in reverse order and I'll start with Commissioner Hamby. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I appreciate appreciate y'all putting this together and appreciate the work uh, Judd and uh, Attorney Drake has done on this and Manager Williams. So I guess I'm looking at it from this standpoint. I appreciate the, the sort of revolving loan aspect of it, but you know I guess in this in this day and time and this challenge, not sure how 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 good a or how worthwhile a loan would be for. Perhaps I mean I know, you know people are trying, and it may be. So I'll have to. I guess I'm curious to see what others say about it as well. Um, no, no, they're gonna they're gonna be behind when they when they're able to get back on their feet, and and uh, alone will make them even further behind. So I guess I guess I'm looking at it from another standpoint of, of how we can, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this during the budget discussions coming up and uh and coming up in may as well so i mean two direct ways that we could look at um look at uh, providing some relief are of course through some of the fees that we charge i know i know we've gotten several calls about the about the, the uh, liquor license fees and alcohol license fees uh i know we can also probably look at what we charge for our business license fees during during these uh during the budget cycle, but also there's, you know, a direct way to help people in the community is also looking at our millage rate and seeing what, uh, I'm sure we'll hear in just a few minutes, what our projections are for our, our uh, property tax digest for, for the next budget cycle. So looking at those, looking at the fees and looking at millage rate are some of the direct ways we can put some money back into uh, pockets that doesn't necessarily mean direct assistance, a different, kind of a different route. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Commissioner Hamby. Uh, Commissioner uh, Thornton. Everybody get that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Commissioner Thornton. I'm going uh, to move uh, on to Commissioner Harrod. Uh, thanks. No, I, I mean, I, 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 said, I am here. Oh. I am Go ahead, here. Avita. I'm sorry. I got to get used to this. Um, first of all, I do want to thank the work that the attorney has put into this. Um, on the revolving loans, we have um, groups that have already uh, received loans um, through um, the county government. Is there any relief or thought about those who have already received loans or have a loan? Um, uh, County Manager Blank Williams. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you're speaking about our current revolving loan fund administered through HCD with the, that was capitalized with HUD funds, and yes. um, and it has to go to benefit low to moderate income individuals. Uh, yes. And that that RLF is governed by those HUD guidelines, and at this point. Um, we have been able to defer payments until the end of the calendar year, but I'm not sure about forgiveness. Uh, Commissioner, we'd have to check into that. So those people who have received those loans, have they been notified about the deferment? Um, we're in the process. Yes, they have, and we're in the process of um, getting that word out still. Um, my next question, um, question and um, concerns I wanted to uh, piggyback on Commissioner Hamby about looking at some real tangible things that we can do to alleviate 
some of the financial pressures. And so am I to understand we do have the option to look at um, uh, our military. Is that an option when we get to discussing the budget? Yes, no, the mayor and commission have the ability to lower or raise the millage rate as they see fit. So that is another option that we we, we have in our in our um, powers. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and my last thing, I'm, I'm going to keep reiterating, again, I think the resilient resilient plan is 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 really good. I really hope that um, we would include people in those categories that you created from the community that have maybe a different perspective or a different idea that would still be vetted through um, your office, uh, Commissioner Williams. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that people have a free for all, but I do think there might be some things and viewpoints that just may be missed if we do not create a, 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 a platform that people can feel involved in and given information to, and, uh, and to deposit information and suggestions. That's it. Thanks. Y'all did a good job again. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Harrod? Uh, yes, thanks. So, um, as I said before about the report from the manager's office, which I thought was very good, I think the legal advice we've been getting from our attorney's office also has been very helpful to me. So, I very much appreciate that. Um, obviously, we have to, you know, work within the law. And um, as the at the lowest tier of government, um, we usually have the most restrictions placed on us on what we can and cannot do legally. So I think uh, our attorney's office is obviously going to be busy for a little while further. Um, I would say just two things very quickly. Um, the first about um, the CARES Act and grants. I listened to a very interesting uh, interview this morning on the news with a guy by the name of Tom Colicchio, I think is how you pronounce his last name, who's, who's with the hospitality industry um, in, the, in North America or the United States. And one of the things that he said that was quite interesting, and I think it bears, um, it, it's important for us to think about, is he said that under the CARES Act, for restaurants to receive um, grants of money, they have to commit to keeping 90%, I think, was the number of their employees on for a certain period of time afterwards. And he was saying that given the uncertainty and what's likely to be happening in the near term, that he thought a lot of restaurateurs may actually not be um, applying for um, money from the federal government because they didn't know where they were going to be in two or three months from now. So as we're thinking about the, the CARES package, I think that, that that's something that we need to also be aware of. Some of the minutiae of the act and how local um, small business people may or may not respond to that in in uh, in different ways. The other thing that um, coming back to what manager Williams was saying with regards to um, water and sewer. Um, so he's he's entirely correct uh, about I would say it's about 2008 2009 if I re recall we did issue 220 million dollars in bonds to rebuild the three. Uh, water treatment plants and to also to purchase the new automated um, water meters. And we had to guarantee um, the investors that um, sold the bonds that allowed us to raise that money and do those um, improvements. We had to uh, guarantee them a return on their um, investment. Um, so my question is, look again, looking through the document that the manager's office put together, talking about um, some of the options with water and sewer rates. Um, it's indicated on the bottom of page 17 um, that one option is to, quote, forego the FY 2021 rate increase. And my question is, is that to forego it or is that to um, postpone it uh, or delay it for a year? So in other words, rather than the scheduled rate increase going into effect next year, which uh, is had been considered necessary to make sure we don't default on our bonds, which would be a major catastrophe. Um, 
is the is the plan is the plan simply be to postpone that increase for a year or i was a little bit unsure as to exactly what that statement meant in the document it's a good question commissioner and thank you uh yes uh so and for the benefit of the public um every so many years uh there is a service delivery plan that is put together and it's comprised of several components and it's and it's a very methodical and responsible process where uh, the you know the needs for reinvestment in the system are projected um, the capital needs you know there's an infrastructure element and then there's a funding element that goes to uh, one of two things if, if funds are going to be borrowed to reinvest in the system you know then that, that those loan payments are taken into account um, if it if if um, the we're trying to carry some cash so we don't have to borrow money and have that interest in expense and, and pay for it out of pocket. You know, all of those things are put into um, for financial projections. And, and Commissioner Herod, you've, you've said this before and you've pushed for a universal fee sheet so that we can see all the fees in one place. And, and one thing that we, we do want to uh, be cognizant of is not waiting for so many years and having a sudden rate adjustment that becomes onerous for people. And so with the water and sewer, um, usually annually there's a very incremental change in the rates uh, that supports this bigger plan for running the operation and uh, reinvestment. So you are correct, sir, that this would be uh, most likely a postponing of the rate increase, but to try to provide some uh, relief in this coming fiscal year. Uh, but as, um, continued reinvestments required in, in the enterprise and in the, in, in the infrastructure, uh, most likely we'll see incremental rate increases return. Okay, uh, thanks, that, that's, that's helpful. Anything else, Andy? Can you hear me? Yeah, anything else? Well, I was just gonna say that that's very, uh, it's, it's helpful because um, uh, you know, as the manager said, you know, typically things on the water rates increase, you know, maybe a, a few pennies every year. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify what was meant that basically, um, if we were to go down this road, that um, there would be no increase this year, and we would simply basically be having a year with no increase, and then we would go back to the regular um, schedule for those kinds of small rates increases rather than having a large rate increase because obviously we need to make sure we don't default on $220 million worth in bonds, which would which would be a financial calamity. That's right. Uh, any other questions before I move on? No, I'm good. Okay, uh, Commissioner Edwards. No. No questions as of now. Most have been asked. Thank you. Great. Right. Commissioner Neesmith. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I want to let the public know that we are working on the alcohol license fee uh, relief idea that even though we're not talking about it tonight, uh, we've already seen some ideas and documentation to us from staff. Uh, so we're going to be working on that. So we said we would, we will. Also, want to my colleagues have covered covered the waterfront quite well here, but I want to agree with the idea of about our millage rate. Uh, in fact, uh, we're going to see uh, assessments go up uh, again. They're up probably four or five percent, which means um, more money in the budget if we leave the millage rate where it is. So one of the ideas, and this is going to be a tough budget because there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to our revenues and property in uh, sales taxes and other fees. But if we could uh, set our budget based on our current property tax collections, and then when we see um, the new digest, roll the millage rate back uh, to the point where our property taxes don't go up. In other words, the assessments goes up, but the millage rate gets rolled back and people pay the same property taxes next year as they paid this year. The other thing I uh, wanted to mention was I've been watching some of the modeling out of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation out of Washington, and they update this model every day. 
and they're they're predicting that Georgia, the state of Georgia, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic is going to peak uh, around April the 23rd. You know, this is just a model. It's just a guess, but it's an educated guess. Um, I understand from some of the research folks at UGA that this is a, a pretty well respected uh, group of researchers and modelers and that uh, we we go back down to the bottom in mid-June. I hope that's not too optimistic because maybe, you know, maybe we'll get through this uh, in a relatively short time and you get things normalized. So I just want to give give an array of hope to everybody that based on this model, you know, we're, 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 we're up three weeks from the peak. Uh, and then a few weeks after that, we go back down to the bottom. Um, I also want to say it's we, we let's don't let's don't forget our energy relief fund. I think that's what we called it. Um, that uh, our sustainability folks put together. Uh, there might be some ways to use some of that funding, uh, in 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 maybe a little bit different way in in its initial implementation. And I also also want to compliment uh, staff, Blaine's staff, uh, the the attorney's office. Uh, I, I know that they are working a lot and they're working hard and I must say they're working very, very effectively. We need the guidance and the ideas and the resources that they're giving us. Our, our citizens are demanding information, throwing great ideas at us, asking a lot of questions and I, I encourage our citizens to continue to do that. It gives us ideas, it gives us energy. Uh, it's uh, And communicating with you as uh, the citizens is very, very important. And I also want to thank the work of the commissioners. I know we're all working pretty hard. I know we're all working very hard and it's good work. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it, just, just a couple of things. So just to clarify, uh, a, Attorney Drake, with the the, the direct assistance, especially through, uh, we're to do this through nonprofits. If we were, if we had the specific guidelines, if we created specific programs or had this money go towards specific programs, that is something that, that we could do. Say, just for example, like Meals on Wheels with the Council of Aging. If they didn't have, could we put money in there because that's going to be distributing a food uh, in that specific program, just for an example. I think, uh, and the manager and I talked about this this afternoon, uh, I think the important thing that you have a guideline, generally I think we're, we're okay if we're providing indigen assistance. And uh, as long as we had appropriate guidelines to determine what agency, what agency constituted, and we were able to uh, be very explicit in the, in the guidelines to the, the entity that might be utilizing the funds that they were providing a service to support our uh, indigen population, I think I think we could look to do that. Yes, sir. But we okay. have, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I hear the, the, the how difficult it would be with the small business loan fund and or grants. Um, so I, I, I think I know with that in place, I would agree with Commissioner Hamby and like, let's look at the other way that we can get to this then, you know, which could be us uh, cutting, cutting fees. Um, Mr. Neesmith brought up, you know, the on on the alcohol licensing fees. Um, yeah, if we were able to, if we're saying this is going to last and have an effect of three to four months, then try to cut, you know, uh, a third or a quarter of, of the fees off to make it cheaper there. Um, work at it, work at it from that direction. Uh, and I I do want to do a, a, have a little bit of pushback though on all the talk about the millage rate. Um, which if we had to do it, whatever, but like at the same time, we, we didn't have, we have other taxes in place. We have, we have the, our sales taxes in place, which are much more regressive and affect everyone. So if therefore we were to find out a way to have relief there, that would be relief that actually affected everybody rather than if we did on the millage rate relief, that's really only going to affect property owners and maybe somewhat through a trickle down effect to renters, but, uh, much less directly. So I wondered, um, is it possible that for a, a short period of time, uh, say two to three months or so, 
that we are able to uh, stop the collection of Sploss, Lost or T Sploss or all of the above just so that everybody had an extra three cents on their dollar uh, for you know, the next few months or something. I, I wanted to make sure because, again, like we need to make sure that, we're, that the stuff we're doing here, the relief that we're doing is helping everybody, um, not just those who are property owners and such. So is, is there any possibility with that, um, Manager Williams or, or Attorney Drake? Is that a possibility? Attorney Drake, maybe you'd be positioned to do this or just let us know if that's something you could research. I'll be glad to research that. But I do not think that is something we can do that's been approved already by the voters, and I don't see a legal means of doing it. I'll let the manager follow up. I think it's a wonderful idea, let me say, uh, uh, Commissioner Denson, and applaud you for your, your thoughtfulness and, and your consideration, but uh, I do not, I will I, I will make a, take a second legal look at it. I think it's going to be difficult. Okay, so like we couldn't even just temper. I understand that, yeah, we have to do those things, but what, we couldn't just kind of put a pause on the collections. That's not a possibility. I'm not uh, aware of the way we do that now, but I will research it again. Okay. Thank you, Attorney. And uh, th that's all I have, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wright? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think this is all really good input. I'm glad we're starting our budget talks. Um, it is challenging that it starts off with budgeting for emergency needs but um i'm ready to keep learning and keep going through the powerpoint and getting to the um the big rocks step two for more input thanks commissioner commissioner link yeah um i i want to um follow up on some of the questions that commissioner denson had um when we're talking about waiving fees and waiving the millage rate um it's clear that our hands are pretty tied when it comes to state law as far as what we can, can and cannot do with, with public funds and, and the gratuities clause really limiting us on making direct assistance, whether it's to individuals or to businesses. But we do have some leeway over the fees and we did give the manager um, some pretty broad powers over those fees in that emergency declaration. So I, I would want to encourage us to, um, to look at actually waiving all or significant portions of our occupational tax fees as well as our liquor licensing fees particularly for businesses that have been directly impacted by this crisis i mean there are hundreds of businesses out there that cannot operate at all or, or who are operating at very minimal capacity um so i you know i want us to seriously follow up on that soon and i know those liquor license and occupational tax fees aren't due till november for a lot of bars and restaurants but um most of them squirrel that money away on the front end and, and now they're dipping into that money to just pay the rent at, for a business that they can't even operate and, and some of them are even generously offering their employees some payment um, in the meantime. So I think that we need to follow up on that as quickly as possible and give these business owners some sense of, of security and what the future holds and, and you know where their expenses are, are going to be come November when those fees are due. Um, and I want to address the possibility of water rate reduction and millage rate reduction. I, like Commissioner Denson, I, I question how impactful things like this will be for the people who actually need them. Um, you know, a, a, a freeze in our water rate only amounts to a few dollars a month for your average household. That's not going to do any help for households that have lost complete income and have, you know, a thousand dollar rent payment due. Um, but it will save industries that are continuing to operate that are high water users lots and lots of money. I mean, our poultry plants are still still operating. Um, you know, there's plenty of factory floors that are still operating and profiting because they are valuable parts of the supply chain in this crisis. So um, I think we need to be really um, careful about where we seek some of these fee waivers and, and you know, and, and being a little bit more um, particular about where we aim aim some of these some of this assistance. Um, the same thing with the millage rate. We have no means by which to um, enforce uh, and you know landlords to trickle down that savings. Um, the people that are really impacted by this crisis, you know, in the service industry, probably aren't homeowners or property owners, and the, very few businesses actually operate out of property that they own. 
So, um, you know, there's no obligation for those, those property owners to pass that savings on to tenants. Um, and there's no means of enforceability by which we could make them do that. The state of Georgia, I don't believe, would allow us to. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like we're going to have to get a lot more creative. Um, and yeah, I think we are going to have to call upon the state to maybe waive some of these restrictions in this crisis. So we can be a little more particular and progressive in, in how we waive fees and taxes um, so that those waivers are aimed very particularly at the people that need the most assistance. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Parker. Commissioner Parker, you might be on mute. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. And thank you for calling upon me. Um, my first couple of questions have to do with public utilities. Um, I was wondering if a waiver on just the rate of late fees could be given for a time period to be put in place. Uh, I think we are delaying um, the payment for any late fees or penalties at this point. Um, okay. And I can give you some more information on that. Uh, waiving them okay. all together. We may be limited in waiving them all together, though. Okay. So limited in terms of how long we're able to do so or whether or not we are going to waive them for a certain period and then collect later. Just wanted to clarify. Sure, sure. Well, uh, the bond ordinance associated with the debt that was referred to earlier um, does have a, a section on enforcement of bills um, that uh, we need to exercise remedies reasonably available to assure prompt payment of charges for services supplied by the system. So I think there, I believe there's room for us to delay the payments, but ultimately we do have to recoup. Okay. Um, one suggestion that was given to me is that we extend the time period for 60 days past the conclusion of the emergency so that um, people are able to reestablish financial stability. Um, I think that's something we should look into and explore. Um, I heard mentioned briefly uh, that water relief for nonprofits is an option under the structure of the bond covenant. And I was wondering if that had been given any consideration. Uh, not, not at this point. Um, we, we, um, it's something we're looking at. And I will also say too, that, um, we weren't quite ready to do it, but there is talk about restructuring the water rate overall for everyone. And, and for some of the, of, of you that have kept close watch of this, you know, there's some concern that maybe some of the water, the tiers that we have for charges may be too closely banded in that. We may be able to expand those a little bit before people leap up to the next tier, which is more mm -hmm. expensive. And so I think you can expect to see something from staff in the next four to six weeks to bring you an expansion of the tiers, which would result in uh, more revenue staying in the rate, in the pockets of the rate payers. Okay, thank you. Um, in general, regarding a lot of these approaches, I'm most interested in figuring out how we can provide as best we can direct assistance to individuals. I think it relieves the burden of small businesses of navigating loans that have a payroll. It's got the opportunity to include coverage for individuals in the service and under other industries who may have been exploited by employers um, and who have you know paid them under the table or something like that and who are therefore ineligible for other tort forms of uh, assistance through things like unemployment as well as helps um, individuals retain autonomy to meet their own needs which I think is really important during this time. So if possible, and I think this is akin to what was brought up by Commissioner Denson, if we could be provided with some more examples of appropriate guidelines that need to be put in place to legitimate grants to nonprofits for direct assistance to individuals, that would be really helpful because as of this point, I think that a lot of the guidance you've been receiving to that end has been somewhat vague and it's hard for me to, you know, help ma imagine how a program like that could be structured without understanding of what those appropriate guidelines need to be under state law. That's it. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, I, I'll note that um, several of the pieces of guidance I have gotten about the CARES Act 
um, note that unemployment assistance is available for um, tipped and service employees in a much broader way than typically is true uh, around mm -hmm. unemployment. So, you know, I, I certainly hope that some of our guidance to the community involves uh, how those employees can best avail themselves of, of resources um, since they they may not be accustomed to that, uh, unlike a typical salaried employee. So, uh, Commissioner Davenport. Yes, yeah, so I would like to echo what um, Commissioner Link said about our, our business, the, the liquor license and you know some of the waivers. Um, she pretty much hit the nail on the head of what I was going to say, but I also like to thank, because um, it's been it's been some trying times, and I, I, I think we need to all, you know, uh, pat each other on uh, each other on the back and, you know, thank those who, especially the manager's office, as well as um, the attorney's office for helping us through these troubled times. So um, I do want to just give my kudos to the staff. Mm, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Um, all right, Manager Williams, um, you know, we, we've kind of heard reference to some of the elements of uh, what's in the next few slides of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so uh, if you could move through the rest of that and then time for any kind of final comments uh, before we move on to the big rocks. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate the comments everybody had. And 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 so it has been uh, a little over a week. Uh, we, we turned that the, 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 um, the staff gave some feedback on some programs and it does lack some uh, specificity on purpose. We wanted to, to try to find thread the needle to where we gave enough uh, of detail to make uh, to make sense and people could comprehend what we were trying to achieve, but also leave enough room for feedback from not only you, but also the public uh, to make sure that we were, we were creating something that was meaningful. And, um, and to Commissioner Hamby's point, uh, the questioning about loans versus grants, and again, my learning curve on the gratuities clause has been uh, steep one because we don't normally engage in that and, and certainly what you're trying to achieve I think is laudable. Uh, part of the thought was if we were going to capitalize, uh, you know, is there things that we could do that could survive this event and continue to pay dividends and be helpful to the community? And that's where we came up with the revolving loan program at a one, you know, low or no interest loan, uh, you know, just a bridge, if you will, to get folks buy in these times and that was true of the nonprofit as well because these are two instruments right now or vehicles that don't exist in this community by and large we do have the rlf commissioner thornton has alluded to but it's very small all things being considered so um i won't go into this at length because we we seem to have some uh legal issues that we need to sort through to create such a thing i, I will say dan mccray does think it's uh possible and if this is something long term beyond this particular event you're interested in, uh, it could be that we have to approach the legislature to get some certain permissions to do this type of um, um, activity. But again, for the viewing public, uh, the CARES Act is coming very quickly behind us with, with some assistance. Uh, emergency assistance program, I, uh, some of you had suggested, well, perhaps, you know, we could we could give funds to say the community foundation and that could be uh, with their COVID-19 response fund, which I think has uh, been very successful at raising funds to help, you know, distribute um, that those uh, resources across the nonprofit community. And as we heard the uh, attorney say, it's going to have to be a little more specific than that as far as, to, you know, with a nonprofit for services. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, as staff, we did refer back to data. Uh, from the Athens Wellbeing Project, and I think these are things that are relevant regardless of, of how this all shakes out. Uh, that uh, rent and utility assistance is something that that was already needed in this community prior to this event. It's only going to be exacerbated by this event. Uh, and hotel, motel, other shelter provisions for the homeless population. Um, you know, with our existing relationships and by your direction, uh, we've been engaging with those homeless providers. Uh, homeless service providers and uh and that and and being able to uh, pay for temporary shelter for families is quickly becoming a need in our homeless provider community so we're continuing to monitor that and working with the attorney see if there is a specific vehicle with specific guidelines that we can quickly get that uh, assistance to them through you 
And then the food assistance, uh, we'll talk about that briefly, but trying to augment uh, what's going on with the, um, with, with, with the good work that the Clark County School District is doing. Uh, the nonprofit revolving loan program, that was another, uh, can we create something that can last in the future? Could it, you know, two years from now help a nonprofit that maybe missed a crucial grant that it expected, but uh, was, had been doing good work historically? Uh, and, and we'll continue to vet that. The resource distribution program, uh, you know, how can we help the Area Council on Aging, the Clark County School District uh, provide additional resources? Uh, right now, uh, Clark County School District has deployed a very effective means of providing food for those children that typically look to the school district for most of their nutrition. Um, and um, we were, you know, again, instead of trying to reinvent uh, any type of service infrastructure, what can we do to help those already out there? And so we are helping them now, uh, regardless of, of uh, through transit buses, through additional assistance, and uh, we're investigating what we could possibly do there. You know, with the school district, it is possible with through an intergovernmental agreement to do certain things that we may not be able to contract directly with, say, a nonprofit, and we're looking at that as well. And I say, and, and, and for the viewing public, these were very specific ideas that we presented to the mayor and commission, and these are things that we don't normally do or have not done traditionally as a local government. And in the later latter half of last week and into the weekend, and even today, we began to really discuss the legal ramifications of that. So that's sort of an overarching um, filter that we're having to look through right now at these ideas that we're having. But again, we wanna hear from the commission and the public on what's possible. Now the Neighbors Helping Neighbors program and the um, Athens Community Corps are two things that we don't think are restricted by uh, legality. If we if we um, structure it the correct way, and um, the Neighbors Helping Neighbors program is an idea that we have seen in other communities, and I think we're all aware of how incredibly civic-minded Athenians are. And I think this would have been well served in place before the pandemic is trying to, to harness and coordinate amongst uh, uh, people that want to help their neighbors, who want to be more involved in their neighborhoods. Um, we've got a variety of listservs, for instance, across some neighborhoods, maybe not all. And so uh, the way that we felt like we could really support that is building on uh, a vision that uh, our inclusion officer had of, of having a coordinator uh, that can help both internally in the government further inclusion and equity, but as well uh, externally, uh, separate, uh, another coordinator to work more externally with that. So what we're proposing here, and again, this is open for further discussion, but just to tell you what's possible, you know, this would be housed within the Office of Inclusion, and uh, this would work very closely with the Community Corps, which I'll explain here in a minute, as well as um, the uh, Neighborhood Leaders Program. And we're using the term neighbor, so it's like, oh, how much of that can we can we pull off? But really, the neighborhood leaders have been hard at work conducting casework and case management, I'm sorry, service and providing feedback and identifying some of those uh, needs and informal leaders. Um, and, you know, those are 16 neighborhood leaders serving a population of about 130,000 residents. And so we feel like supplementing that work of the neighborhood leaders and other um, uh, agency or, or efforts like Los Promotores in the Hispanic community um, and, and with the Athens Community Corps, which I'll explain in a minute, as a workforce, we feel like that this is a way where the government can invest in the community and force multiply through citizens, helping other citizens, being more plugged into their uh, neighborhoods. Uh, we heard this. Uh, and, and again, we went through a very, uh, whenever we go through a very public process, whether it's the SQUAST or when Envision Athens, we had people at the table that didn't normally come to the table. Uh, I think they were thrilled to be a part of that. And as a local government, we've, we've really been challenged to try to harness and, and get people included. And we feel like uh, this could be a good way of doing that. And in the, under the auspices of this crisis, 
um, you know, uh, helping to link neighbors with neighbors who need assistance uh, and, and um, to get people reinvesting in their neighborhoods with their time and energy is something that we think is meaningful. Uh, the community core program, uh, that's something that I know the mayor has talked about. Um, and, and is there a way that we can, uh, if you'll, if you, if y'all think about it, uh, back when Pilgrim's Pride this summer, uh, shut down for, uh, several weeks, uh, to do some improvements in the factory, uh, and they did not want to send their, um, uh, employees home without a paycheck. So they continued to pay them and offered uh, some of their workers to the unified government, and they were able to engage in some work. Um, to remove some invasives and select places and green spaces that we had. So this is not unlike that. Uh, if there are folks that are, are laid off right now, the, the initial idea was if you're receiving unemployment benefits, uh, that we could, uh, you could come work with the unified government on a community project for public good and perhaps receive uh, a voucher that was uh, a grocery voucher or something along those lines. And the legality of that as well is something that we have to be careful about. We're talking through with the attorney's office. Um, certainly, uh, they could be hired as part-time seasonal help. Uh, we need to be careful about jeopardizing un any unemployment benefits with the amount of funds that those folks learn, uh, earned. But this, with the Conservation Corps, what you see in front of you are three concepts that could be under this header. And there's outdoor projects, maintenance, beautification, you know, uh, painting, litter pickup, uh, things that um, we could engage our citizens in uh, to provide them some some work and some uh, extra supplemental funding uh, during this time. And and we do we know that that is legal uh, to hire somebody and have them do something and pay them for them. The neighborhood support core, uh, you know, that's those could be uh, with this community coordinator engagement coordinator. We're talking about the inclusion. Those could be organized neighborhood improvement projects. Uh, those could be adopt, adopt a neighbor to help uh, a ready workforce between the neighborhood leaders uh, and this uh, the volunteer coordinators under Neighbors Helping Neighbors. Uh, this could really help us out. And then Victory Corps is more of a, a community garden program and kitchens program focused on uh, fresh foods and prepared meals for vulnerable populations. So we don't have this totally thought out. Uh, but I think this is a great start that our staff came up with uh, that uh, has some re certainly some relevance now in this crisis, but also uh, going forward as well. We spoke briefly about the public utilities rate reduction, uh, and this would be, uh, and just so the citizens know, um, the new automated meters that, that have been installed that have given us some benefits in terms of notification, uh, you know, if, if there are leaks, if you've signed up through our customer portal, uh, and certainly it, it's, it's been an investment that will help the individual ratepayer over time as far as saving money. And the public utility staff, Interim Director Glenn Coleman, uh, felt like this was a way that we could put a significant amount of money um, back into the community, if you will, foregoing uh, revenue by decreasing this. Now, this is a fixed cost uh, part of the current bill. And the only thing I would say to the commission is, you know, an enterprise like this has fixed cost and they sell a commodity in terms of water and sewer. <clears throat> and that, that commodity can fluctuate over time as far as uh, the use of it. So if you will, the water rates that f folks pay are somewhat volatile and that uh, perfect uh, for instance, is this current crisis uh, with the university shut down and many of the students home, um, the water revenues uh, are down about a million dollars a month uh, and probably a, a little over three million dollars for the rest of this uh, year. So I say all that to say is that we feel like this is a fin financially responsible move because <clears throat> of the uh, efficiencies that we've gotten with the new meters. Um, you know, in a time of drought, uh, if we scale way back on the use of water, then it's, we're going to feel it more in the enterprise, but we can discuss that further. But staff feels strongly that 
this is something that we can do now. And we do feel like uh, that it certainly would be um, a good a good move uh, to, to uh, not increase the water and sewer rates for this coming year. And then investing in public safety enhancement. And Mayor, I can talk more about that during Big Rocks if that's more appropriate, but um, I, I will say to the view in public, well, why is this, why did we include public safety enhancement beyond what the mayor and commission um, asked for? And I will say that the public safety enhancements, uh, at this point, none of the prosperity package funds are being are, are recommended for use of this. This was part of something that we wanted to do in the FY21 budget, but we feel like both of these are relevant to the current crisis in that uh, a lot of our, our first responders are working long hours and overtime, uh, we're having to plan our shifts accordingly so that uh, we don't have uh, illness wipe out our ranks and that we cannot provide the vital services that you, you have come to expect and, and require. And then with emergency medical dispatch, that's a heightened level of 911 call taking where um, medical protocols are followed where uh, the call taker and, and the victim, if you will, are given some guidance on how to navigate until first responders get there. So both of these are relevant to it. And, and we've seen, at least in one other community, where uh, investing in their public safety uh, services, enhancing those was something they want to do in concert with the, uh, with the pandemic. So again, those were the recommended objectives for the package and those, uh, the first three were given to us directly by the mayor and commission and we've added the fourth. And um, at that point, Mayor, I'll entertain any other questions. Um, thank you, Manager Williams, I, I appreciate it. And before I get a final input on this from commissioners, um, I, I'll just say that it seems that, you know, we've got some very viable options that we can move forward with in the relatively near term. Um, and for my own part, I'll say my interest in things like the community core are um, most significantly fixated around supporting those most vulnerable residents that we have, unsheltered persons, young people um, who could be graduating high school and then into an environment where um, there's not employment. And of course, they may not have or likely to not have a history of employment. Um, and those people who've never been part of the traditional economy uh, it's certainly been part of our goals and objectives over the course of this entire fiscal year to ask how we can do a better job really lifting the floor up uh, around workforce development and steering people into an employment situation. And um, if anything, I think this crisis creates an opportunity for us to create something more sustainable there um, and get those people, whether you're 18 years old or 50 years old, into a setting where um, you then are engaged with this local government uh, ideally engaged in employment and um, and income. Uh, so I'm um, very eager to move forward with those pieces. Um, it's pretty clear that um, information is critical for those folks who might either be business centers or individuals. And so every available outlet for us to distribute that information is something that, that I want us to put some resources toward. Um, and finally, for commissioners and for the viewing uh, public, um, you have had a lot of questions about extension of the emergency order, and I anticipate us to move forward with uh, extension um, in probably uh, at least a month long basis. You know, we, we think that realistically, based on what epidemiologists and um, similar scientists are saying right now, that as you heard earlier, we're looking at a June timeframe before we get back to anything approaching normalcy. So I would probably imagine us moving in a kind of one month extension with some um, potentially modest modifications. Um, and we can talk about those in, in the next couple of days, but um, you'll likely see that on the agenda for next Tuesday. And I do want to signal to the public well in advance of next Tuesday that there will be an extension uh, of our emergency ordinance. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to commissioners and I'll just go ahead and start with Commissioner Davenport for any final thoughts before we move into uh, our first look at the FY21 budget. Thank you, Mayor. I'm ready to get into the budget. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Parker. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have 
lots of questions and thoughts. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm really excited about significant portions of this. I think things like paid support for community that community beautification, environmental restoration, and things like community gardens are a good way to not only tackle what we're currently going through, but put structures in place that could be sustained after the, the end of this that will help our community grow stronger. And so I'm really enthusiastic about those. Um, I want to, however, um, bring our focus back to, you know, the criticality of making sure we prioritize um, vulnerable populations that were, you know, already experiencing crises, which have been normalized previous to this broad crisis, um, and whose issues have been exacerbated. So thinking about um, prioritizing workers with precarious jobs and lower wages, more so than folks with job stability or higher incomes, helping renters more than homeowners and low wealth homeowners more so than homeowners generally, and thinking about how we can help small local businesses over large businesses and corporations. I think we're doing that already. I just also feel that it's really strongly that we need to continually bring the conversation back to that so we don't lose focus. Um, some feedback that I received from folks who had looked over this presentation included questions about how community partners are being defined. I think because they represent organizations that they felt had not been consulted in compiling this response. So to that end, what organizations are on the current list of community partners that have been consulted thus far and, if, and whether or not they represent specified service areas or whether or not their services are provided countywide? Well, thank you, Commissioner. And, and as you can see, uh, we don't name any uh, specific nonprofits here. Uh, we did uh, speak with the uh, Community Foundation uh, that had been suggested as uh, with their big fund, I think, early on in this conversation with the Mayor and Commission. So we did engage them uh, to see if if they were a vehicle by which we could distribute funds if we could not give them directly to the nonprofit. And you've heard some of the concerns there from the uh, attorney. So at this point, we have not we have not uh, spoken with a great number of nonprofits because we didn't know what was possible. We wanted to bring to you some general ideas to get your feedback and then we could move into more of an implementation posture. And it's a okay. good thing we did because we've got some legal issues we've got to work through. I got you. Um, on that same, so on a similar vein to that, um, I think there's been some concern in the community that efforts we undertake might duplicate the services being provided by certain, some of these community, you know, potential community partners, uh, nonprofits, churches, as examples. I wanted to draw our attention to the work of the Athens Mutual Aid Network and some things that have been outlined to us in a recent email, but uh, make this available to the public as well as um, bring this into clear focus for folks on the commission in the manager's office. Um, so they currently consist of over 60 volunteers who have volunteered themselves to purchase and deliver groceries, provide emotional support, pet care, and organize their neighborhoods into neighborhood pods. And through people who have donated their money through communal pool, they've already been able to disperse funds to help pay six individuals rent and utilities, medical costs in the last few days alone. Um, their focus is on um, populations ineligible for federal and nonprofit aid, such as underdocumented folks and people on disability and or who have been unemployed or people or people who lack the required documentation to be eligible for services from the ARC and similar funding sources. They currently have about 15 neighborhood pod point persons and one third of those volunteers have completed orientations and begun flyering in their neighborhoods to invite them to neighborhood group chat phone tree. Um, so these are operations that are already up and running, and um, Scott Blackwell, Amani Scott Blackwell, who is um, organizing these efforts, has personally been managing a net the network infrastructure, including a hotline, volunteer aid request form, um, mutual aid communal money pool and disbursement. Um, and so as the impact of the pandemic spreads, this level of engagement will quickly become unsustainable. So they're beginning to onboard additional coordinators, um, and they have received volunteer intake forms from a number of people who have noted they can't do this work for free. So I just want to um, 
highlight that these efforts are ongoing in our community already and invite us to consider how we can integrate those efforts into the structure of our final package um, as we move forward. Um, a few other questions that I had, and I'm going to start jumping all over the place because they're, they kind of popped into my head somewhat randomly. Um, coming back to the question of community partners, uh, someone um, inquired with me whether or not support would, any support would be given to private or pro, pro, excuse me, for-profit providers, and if so, which ones? I'm sorry, Commissioner. Could you repeat the question? Certainly, yeah. So um, some were inquiring whether or not pro um, support would be given to private or pro for-profit providers. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see that in here. That I don't think that was recommended. When you say provide, okay, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't being recommended. <laughs> uh, well, that's good to hear. Um, in terms of things that we've implemented thus far, and that could be good to like continue once this crisis is over. I know that um, we have worked to to install a number of hand washing stations in the community. Um, I was wondering if these were, this was something that we were con considering continuing after this crisis has seen it then. Uh, we, we, we've not discussed that. We were focused on just getting them deployed as quickly as we could. Uh, they got okay. snapped up, they got snapped up pretty quick. And so uh, I'm not sure that there are any more available to us. Uh, it's not really a, a, a large fee. Um, so we haven't discussed the long-term use of them, deployment of them. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, in terms of providing shelter assistance, I was wondering if there had been attempts to partner with UGA or local churches for that purpose. Uh, I know, and, and to your point uh, earlier, Commissioner, we, there are other folks that we've spoken to, uh, nonprofits, but just trying to assess need and that, you know, the homeless shelter, Athens Area Homeless Shelter, uh, the coalition, a Salvation Army, you know, so we, there have been some nonprofits engaged just trying to, to figure, to see the lay of the land. Uh, the university, um, I think there were some, there have been some conversations about what's possible. I know that um, there's been some reaching out to local hotels and, and, and a lot of this too is under the auspices working with public health. You know, how do we shelter people? Uh, what are the plans in the future if we have a large number of folks that uh, need to isolate or um, or have tested positive, you know, and that's something I know public health yeah. looking at as well. So we have we've asked a whole bunch of questions of a whole bunch uh, of different entities of what's possible. Okay. Um. Let's see. Um. I'd like to, and I, I said this earlier, but I'd like to reiterate um, if we could consider funding assistance to be provided to organizations such as community supported agriculture projects to help with food distribution more generally while supporting local growers. Um, and I think that's about it for my question. Thanks, Commissioner. Yeah, uh, Commissioner thank Lake? Um, yeah, um, I wanna thank Commissioner Parker for reminding us to focus our, our efforts on those who are truly most impacted by this crisis. Um, I think it's really important that no matter what we do, that we maintain that focus. Um, and I also want to um, applaud the Community Corps program. That's, you know, something that I've kind of been advocating for something like that for a while, you know, kind of modeled after the Young Urban Farmers or Urban Builders program where you're, you're giving folks actual jobs um, to enter the workforce and, and, um, and, and being out in the community and doing so. Um, and I kind of wonder if we can't kind of take that model. I mean, it, we, we're not allowed to, you know, because of the gratuities clause, we can't just give people money for assistance, no matter how badly they need it, but we can pay them for their work. And we certainly have plenty of work that needs to be done, um, not only on, on the, these kind of community beautification and environmental programs that, that you know, are always out there, but we have a huge slate of SPLOS and t -SPLOS programs, and we often farm those out or contract those out. And, and I would really hope that we could start focusing on 
training individuals within our own community to do that kind of work. It, it's, you know, it's, it's well-paid work. We, we pay lots and lots of money to contractors to, to build things that are paid for with our sales tax dollars. So I'd, I'd like to see us kind of, you know, develop a program that focuses on that. These would be well-paid and, and fairly permanent jobs, um, you know, because we renew these SPLOS and T-SPLOS programs regularly and there are always projects going on. Um, and also, we could also pay these folks to build housing, um, you know, our, for our homeless. Uh, a lot of other communities are doing these kind of tiny homes for the homeless and they're, they're not exactly like houses, they're more like sheds, but they're, you know, they, they do provide some kind of shelter um, and privacy for a growing homelessness, homeless population, which likely is going to get even bigger um, in the aftermath of this crisis. Um, so, you know, we do have encampments that are have been broken up in recent years as GDOT has cleared right of ways and, and private property has, has changed hands and, and folks have been moved off these pieces of land and they really need some kind of facilities. You know, if we could provide some kind of facilities and um, give people jobs in helping to, to build them. Even some of those homeless folks could, could um, get paid to help build some of these facilities. Um, and as far as the Athens Mutual Aid Network, which is kind of like sprung up it, on its own in response to this crisis, um, maybe that's where we could link up our neighborhood leaders with, it sounds like they've kind of got an organized thing going on. And, and uh, from what I understand, the neighborhood leaders program has not actually been all that organized yet. So maybe linking up those two entities um, with, you know, the neighborhood leaders with an entity that's already on the ground directly responding to this crisis could, um, you know, get, get things moving as quickly as possible with resources that we've already funded. Um, so I, I think that's it. I'm, I'm, I am excited about, I mean, you know, there's, when you have a crisis like this, there's so, so much bad that comes out of it, but also there's the potential for so much good. So I'm excited that we are already looking at, at moving forward and, and building something that's sustainable and that we can come out of this on the other end even better and stronger than before. Thank you, Commissioner Link. Commissioner Wright? Um, yeah, thank you. I have just three comments. One, I wanted to summarize about the resolution content to make sure the public is aware that that was a uh, unified f call for action in the spirit of uh, compassion and that it's not like we can do anything to follow up on, on some of those ideas as far as in the context of uh, the, the, the things in the work session we're talking about what we can do to match that um, resolution um, information. Um, the other thing was I wanted to find information um, in when we learned that the uh, inmates have phone calling cards that they're able to use to make their collect calls out. Um, I'm hoping we can get an email follow up on how we can improve or increase the number of calling cards. It doesn't sound like we can send those to each person, but maybe we can, uh, as we talk about these uh, budgeting for emergency needs, we can allocate more from move them up on the list and they can help out with some things, maybe the broadband, I don't know, what could be some of the topics, but I think committee work also, maybe we can reshuffle some of the things in committee. I know some of the stuff in LRC right now seems like uh, uh, we could reprioritize some of the committee work, but that's all I wanted to add, uh, except for also compliments on all the work that, that our government is doing to keep services open and the um, lengthy information in the documents that we got uh, and making sure everybody else has those. Two. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, just a few things. Um, Going back to the direct assistance to individuals and the nonprofits that we talked about, that we need to have uh, uh, specific programs that they dealt with uh, indigent folks and everything. I know the uh, Blaine brought up the um, Athens Area Community Fund. Uh, 
fun there. But I think something that we I would like us to be really working with would be the ARC, which specifically works to do assistance to individuals for rent utility assistance. Um, that's something they have going on now, and I'd love for us to be able to find a way to uh, be putting that money into that program uh, with that very specific um, outcome that we're seeking to do assistance for rent utilities. Um, um, yeah, the Athens Community Corps is awesome and amazing, and um, I want us to embrace that as quickly as possible, and especially during this time, to definitely think of it as a bit expanded, as as Commissioner Link uh, brought up here, um, so that we could we could be using it to to you know pay folks who maybe aren't uh, always in a rough time, but they are temporarily right now. For um, and, and since we can't give them money directly. That could be something we can do, and and big yes to us being able to expand it in the future to use for SPLOST and TSPLOST projects. Um, <clears throat> that was kind of one of uh, my pitches for prosperity package funding, anyways. So I'd love for us to be able to do that. Just have some of those SPLOST and TSPLOST projects. Utilize local folks. Utilize yeah, uh, some young people. Utilize some people that are having a rough time financially, and and, and have them assist building some of those capital projects. Um, and also, I think we could think of it in the same way, uh, but again, better. At, like we rely on our inmate labor program for a lot of these kind of things that instead could be done through something like Athens Community Corps. And again, if we're going to actually have inmates doing those projects, we should pay them in the same way that we'd be paying people through the Athens Community Corps. Um, another one is uh, again the focus on um, on, on migrant uh, uh, migrant families, undocumented families here in town. I definitely think we need to be focusing on Athens Immigrant Rights Coalition and Dignidad Immigrante Athens, uh, making sure that, that we're pulling them into this and making sure that we're giving them resources so that they can reach those communities that I think are, are, are difficult for us to reach in our normal everyday work that, and how we operate. But those groups are very uh, skilled and, and, and connected to those, those 3,200 3, uh, households who need that help. Um, to the Athens Mutual Aid Network, yes, it's fantastic, and I think it ties in directly to the Neighbors Helping Neighbors program we're talking about. So maybe we could be merging those things together and getting some of those folks who are doing fantastic work right now for free and actually helping them get uh, some funding. And then um, I like uh, Commissioner Parker's idea for uh, looking at UGA to try to help us uh, house some of our unhoused populations here. Um, love to see if maybe there's a UGA dormitory that's open during the summer or during this next few months, months that we might be able to utilize. A place that already has bedrooms and showers and kind of ready to go for something like that. And that hopefully would be cheaper for us than having to do hotels. Um, and the last one is, uh, yeah, on the uh, phone, phone situation with inmates at the jail since the station just shut down. Um, let's just get rid of our for-profit. Uh, phone call system we have through Securus. Uh, the reason that it's expensive for people to do is because it's being run by a for-profit company and that athens Clark County is taking a kickback for part of that funding. Um, we should never have that, that contract in the first place. Let's get rid of it and operate phones in, the, in a regular kind of way in which we can make sure it's only costing inmates and families at cost, if anything. Um, so that, I think that's, that one's an easy fix. That would be a, a, a a productive thing going forward too. Um, but with that, that's my last comment. Can't hear you, Mayor. Oh, I apologize, Commissioner Nee Smith. I was a muted. Uh, um, uh, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, well, first, I'll just start uh, with some of the things that, that Commissioner Jensen said. I, I, I totally agree with him about the jail phone system. Uh, if the jail needs more revenues, they shouldn't be taking it from the inmates. They should be asking us for it. Uh, just a little insight on using UGA dorms for whatever reason. Um, did a little research on that, and we actually have to go through the through GEMA, the Georgia Emergency Medical folks uh, first, and I think that's actually a state statute, odd as it may be. I uh, don't think the university would have the objection to it, but the university can't give us permission to do that, just to, just to let you know. 
Um, on SPLOST and using um, Community Core, I think that's a great idea. I think we need to look at uh, how we could structure our SPLOST uh, RFPs, which are what goes out for contracts just to do these projects. Try to roll that into there. It's going to have to be something that uh, the, the contractors agree on. These projects are so big, uh, we're, we're not going to be the, we're not going to be the contractor. Uh, but if we could figure out a way to require uh, that kind of participation, that, that would be wonderful, especially in these times and the times to follow. Um, Manager Williams, just want to let you know that the public safety uh, enhancements that you agreed to. Those are things I've been asking for for a while. So that was actually a commission desired uh, discussion. Um, Unity Corps is a great idea and I fully support the ARC. Um, I've been involved with them a couple of times just this week and they've been very, very responsive. So let's figure out how we can help those guys. Um, thank you guys. You're all, you're all doing work, including you guys, my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, sir. Um, I had a quick question for Manager Williams. Um, since downtown has been effectively quieted down quite a bit, would it not be prudent to go full steam ahead on the Clayton Street renovation? How, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, that's a great point. And our public works folks were very excited about that prospect. And then the question came, but can you do the work and be uh, observe social distancing? That was, you know, within the last couple of weeks. And uh, the thought was uh, that it, it was difficult at best, but, but uh, the mayor's mentioned this, uh, you've mentioned this, um, others have mentioned this. And so our folks have taken another look at that. Um, they do feel like uh, if they can minimize the size of the crew to just the two folks, and regardless of the crew size, keep six foot distance. Um, solo drivers going to and from. I mean, you can imagine we, we, we've had multiple people in these trucks, which you know saves gas. But in this case, that's not. Um, the other thing that that we need to know is or is that we have asked all of our employees, Commissioner you know, if they are at risk or they have somebody in their household that is at risk. And if that, those answers are yes, then we're giving them consideration accordingly. And so we just, we really need to work through uh, what staff could be available for this type of work. But we wholeheartedly agree that this would be least disruptive to the businesses when they're closed to try to get some of this work done. Well, maybe we could, <clears throat> maybe we could outfit some of those workers with masks to minimize the harm that they would suffer should they come within six feet. Um, we can look at that. Yeah. The PPE, the PPE, like most of the hospitals, is being reserved for our uh, first responders. Uh, and, and we all know, we're all reading about the utility of the mask, but I hear what you're saying. And, and if we would definitely, we're trying to make it as safe as we can. But still get the work done. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I also kind of like the idea of the the um, the local. Um, I forget the exact title, but the core uh, kind of reminds me of the CCC, one of the New Deal agencies in the 1930s, and so I think. Um, as uh, somebody said, maybe it was Commissioner Link. I mean, I think that although we're going through a, a, a extremely tough time, I think um, once we come out the other end, this also gives us an opportunity to perhaps maybe rethink some of the ways that we've done things in the past. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Commissioner Neesmith said. He's, he's entirely correct about um, the UGA dorms. The University of Georgia actually does not own the dorms. They're owned by the university system, and so... Um, even if UGA wanted to, they, as my understanding is they don't make the decision about who can and cannot go in there. That would have to go through um, Atlanta and be evaluated by GEMA. So um, Commissioner Neesmith's correct in that. Uh, my question really, though, had to do with next steps. So obviously we've got a lot on our 
uh, on our plate. We've talked a lot about things this evening. I think there's a lot of great stuff and ideas in what the manager's uh, team put together. Um, but it seems that we're kind of in a holding pattern at the moment until our attorney's office, which has been doing absolutely sterling work, uh, but we're in kind of a holding pattern at the moment until our attorney's office can do some more research on whether some of these things that we've kind of brainstormed with, whether we can do those legally. Is, am, am I interpreting where we're at correctly or what's where are we at? Well, I can offer this and um, certainly Attorney Drake can respond. But, what you know, we're learning. And, and just within the last couple of days since the release of the package, we've gotten some more feedback on what's possible and what's challenging. Um, what I've heard from, from the attorney today, we had a, a phone call this afternoon, and, and he has uh, indicated this evening through your questions that, that providing assistance to nonprofits for services for indigent populations is something that uh, I believe he said could be defended. And so I just wanted to answer from a staff perspective, Mr. Herod, um, you know, continuing to flesh out the community core uh, idea, the neighborhoods helping neighbors um, and looking at different partnerships and uh, getting that feedback on uh, coming up with those specific strings, if you will, those requirements that, that would make the pass a litmus test of us giving um, funds to uh, a nonprofit to provide services that are needed at this time by certain populations. That's what we're going to continue to work on. But Attorney Drake. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Manager, uh, that's correct. I agree with uh, your assessment and my guidance uh, regarding that issue. So, so I guess my question then is, um, you know, when when will we be ready, do you all think, to move and have something put in place? Because obviously, you know, a lot of people are hurting now. Um, and so obviously we, you know, I'd rather us move sooner rather than later, but what, what's kind of realistic as we, as we try to, un, um, as we try to roll out things, what is a realistic time frame to actually, you know, get some balls moving? Well, the next, uh, next opportunity as a body that you're meeting to vote is next Tuesday, of course, at your regularly scheduled voting meeting. And we can take the feedback. We had hoped to take the feedback that we heard tonight. And, and again, Mr. Herod, you know, we've been a week into it and still trying to understand the legality of it. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can bring something to you for consideration next Tuesday that, that moves us in the direction of more definition and, and, and uh, finality. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. We're going to work very hard with the attorney's office. Uh, we'll add some more flesh to the, uh, the concepts that you uh, have responded affirmatively to. And, uh, and perhaps it's a, it's a high level, all right, take the next step and let's move this forward, time being of the essence. Manager Williams, ju just to kind of break in here for a second on this, um, I, I do wanna make the point that I don't think anybody anticipates that this is a, a single action, but instead a sequence of actions. And um, given that we know we're probably in a likely 10 week pattern of significant need, um, these will be rolled out uh, segment by segment. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Thornton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I uh, commend the work of um, staff and um, the attorney's office and commissioners. Um, my concern always comes back to the homeless and those vulnerable populations. Um, I guess my, my, my concern is about the day center on North Avenue. And is it true that Vision has closed for overnight stay for homeless? Does anybody that, know? That, that's our understanding, yes. So we have another group of people that are now not having a place to sleep at night. Is that right? Yes. Uh, that, yes, that's my understanding. Um, we, we have been in contact with Bigger Vision to see um, 
what kind of assistance we can provide them to possibly get that back open. We've also, um, Haley Banerjee and others have been speaking with Vision to see if what, what type of assistance they could require to open up at least their showers and laundry uh, because those are existing facilities. And it appears that um, the um, that staffing is an issue. And so we, uh, Housing Community De Development Director uh, Banerjee has come up with some estimated cost and how we might be able to supplement staffing. Uh, and that was something that came in later, late, late today that I've not been able to cover with the attorney. Okay. But that seems to me to pass that litmus test. But we'll, but of course we have to. The attorney has to look at it, of where we're we're paying a provider to provide a service to an indigent population, which seems to be those those three hurdles right there uh, seem to be satisfied, and of course it's an immediate need as well. So those are being okay. Mr. Thornton. Okay, thank you. So um, my next question then. So the Salvation Army and the uh, uh, homeless shelter ooh, over there on, um, is that, uh, what would that be? The other homeless shelter. Do those, Hawthorne. is it Hawthorne? Hawthorne is the Salvation Army. What's the other one? The on one Barbara on, Street. on Barber Street, yeah. So do those shelters meet the um, required distance or does, or is that an issue? So uh, that was our first assumption that, that we would help them de-densify, um, create some space. They're actually managing okay with that, although, again, uh, the need for f homeless families uh, to get them out of the shelters and into separate quarters is what we're hearing is the biggest need. Um, but they are, uh, these shelters are, are trying to comply with, with HUD distancing requirements. And, and do they have the PPE stuff uh, for the workers there to protect the workers? Uh, that I'm not aware of. I've not been a part of that conversation, but we can certainly follow up on that. Okay. And I guess since the, since Bigger Vision, and, I, and this may have happened already, since Bigger Vision has, um, um, Closed. I do know there was a sanita a sanitizing um, um, equipment there, um, and I didn't notice it. I did not notice one at the day center. Have we were we able to put a, a sanitizing system uh, at the day uh, the the homeless day center? And if you don't know, that's fine. I just want to put on your um, on your radar because when I went over there, there were over forty people sitting outside, and they had actually ran out of supplies. So that is so. And I have, you know, I I, I, I have reached out, and we've been in contact with Commissioner um, Parker, um, but they have sent us a list of things they need, and I don't understand. I have a hard time understanding why I got that list, maybe because I asked for it, but they should not be running out of basic um, health needs. So if you would um, put that with your operational um, operational um, folk, I would, I would like to have some response next week on that, if that's okay. Um, on the millage rate, I don't know much about millage rates, um, and property taxes, but I don't think we should differentiate between renters and low income. Uh, one of the reasons that we deal with gentrification is because of the increase in, in property taxes for homeowners that cannot afford to stay in their neighborhood. So I don't think we should separate renters, low income, we should look at a combination of things that will help with um, where people live at. Um, I, I, I don't know how we do it. And I, and I imagine next week that given some of this feedback that you, that you received tonight, you'll have a combination of things. I don't think one, 
I don't think one answer is going to solve the bigger problem. So I'm I'm thinking that you're taking all of these, but I do have a concern when we when we try to say one is more important than the other on any issue. And military rate and property taxes are just important to me as somebody else that may have a huge house. So hopefully when you um, come back with, you know, some continuation that you'll you'll be bringing us some combination of things. Um, I want to I want to um, agree with and support um, Commissioner Parker's idea about community. I think your um, staff has done a wonderful job, an excellent job on this first rollout of the resi resiliency uh, plan. I don't think that, um, and I think it could be better. Maybe that's the way I should put it. If we are hearing from boots on the ground and people there, I hope that next week, between now and next Tuesday, you will reach out to folk in the community who have boots on the ground and not only come up with your ideas that you're, that you're gathering from your research and your data, but people who are already doing this work. Um, I don't think people should do this work for free. I really don't. Um, when we come to trying to help people, um, um, when we come to trying to help people, we want people to volunteer. But we got to put gas in our cars, pay our light bills, and all of that other stuff. So I hope by next week you will consider talking to some other folks um, that Commissioner Parker recommended that I know is going on. West Broad um, uh, has a, a, a wonderful group of people over there working. You can't go into West Broad and tell them what they already know. So I think that next week you would hopefully take what you've already done and, um, and, and just build on it by getting more community input. And my last thought is, uh, oh, um, Manager Williams, did we, were people from the jails released recently? You know, was there a, a release of certain um, people from jail in the last week or two? Uh, my understanding, at least with the diversion center, yes. Okay. Um, and my question is, did we just release them? Did we give them any type of, you know, we just released them. We didn't give them no support when we um, sent them out back into the community. That's my question. And I'll that might be something that you need to know for next. I'm, I'm really concerned about that because we've gotten a lot of calls about releasing people from jail. Um, but if we release them and we're not giving them no support, no information, no, no, no something, they're going to end up back in jail. So um, I wish you would look into uh, that for me. And you know my concerns about the the neighborhood health center. Um, I guess that'd be a conversation we can follow up with with later. But I'm going to go on record. I want the neighborhood health centers to be fully functional, just like the hospitals, because those are frontline folk. And if we do not make sure that the neighborhood health centers, uh, all three of them, are not having the tests the PPEs, they are not going to be able to serve the people that most are most vulnerable. And on that, I think I am, oh, on SPLAS. We are talking about spending and, and, and how we can use SPLAS. If we do not have figure out how we're going to, um, to do things economically um, and how we're going to help these small businesses, how we're going to get the com community on track, there's not going to be a SPLOS. SPLOS is the money we spend. And right now, um, we do not have a mechanism to even think about moving SPLOS or changing SPLOS. We've got to 
figure out how we're going to uh, economically stay strong. And with that, um, uh, Manager Blaine Williams, uh, I will close with, I think we need a, a, a real motivating um, message that we send to the community. I, I, I hope by now uh, we're looking at using WXAG to get the word out uh, with community leaders that, that people know and respect in the community. I thought by now we would have a hotline to answer some of these questions and um, get some of these ideas that we're getting um, by uh, email. Um, those are my things that I would like to have addressed um, next week, if you can, or call me. But I still feel good about the direction we're going in. I do think that this crisis has put us and made all of us better people because this is the kind of work local government should be doing all along. And I don't think that certain people have been included and now everybody's included. So um, hopefully you can answer some of these questions for me tomorrow, um, next week. Um, but I do uh, commend the work that you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner Hamby. Uh, I don't have much. I just wanted to, uh, Andy, uh, Commissioner here addressed a lot of my questions and so did everybody else. I just was concerned about the uh, next steps, but it sounds like the, that's been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Next, uh, next order of business uh, is the FY21 general fund budget update, um, what we historically have called the Big Rocks budget summary um, for commissioners and more importantly for members of the public. Um, the budget process really begins late in the calendar year as department directors uh, begin to assemble um, their existent and coming needs uh, that flows to the manager's office. And then um, along with those independent agencies and constitutional offices, uh, then comes to my desk uh, and then to the commission. Um, in my second year of budget creation now, and I wanted to make it protocol that I get as much information from commissioners as possible so that things can be baked into the budget that comes to you at our um, what are traditionally our April or May budget work sessions. Um, so today's presentation that you're going to get from uh, the county manager, uh, I think potentially with some support from David Boyd in finance, is a very high-flying overview. So um, I'm going to ask him in just a little a bit to go through the presentation. And then the conclusion of that, um, this is a chance just for you to say, I've got some questions or you know, I'd like to know what it looks like to have some other things included in this coming budget. Um, but uh, it's not a kind of heavy back and forth. We will have some uh, several subsequent meetings for that. So I'm going to turn it over to Manager Williams. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so as the mayor mentioned, uh, this is a normal part of our process. Uh, and we the department directors turn in their requested budgets by the end of the calendar year. We spend a couple of months uh, meeting with them, understanding their needs. Uh, the mayor and I both meet with constitutional officers to hear their needs as well. Uh, the charter charges the manager with coming up with the first draft of the budget. Uh, the Big Rocks process, we call it Big Rocks for the viewing public uh, because uh, the, the opportunity for the commission and the mayor to make meaningful changes uh, to the budget come early on in the process with the Big Rocks, and that would be pay and compensation, uh, benefits, uh, some of the big operating uh, commitments or creation of new uh, positions, things of that nature. Um, and of course, the, mayor, the longer the mayor and commission engage in the process, the deeper they go and, and uh, the, the more insights that they can provide. And so tonight is just uh, sort of the big rocks, if you will, and we'll break it down into revenues and expenditures. Um, this is a busy slide. Uh, most of this is borne out in the rest of the presentation. I won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, but just to orient everybody, uh, this is coming at a, a strange time 
uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we've never encountered situations like this. We've never had uh, businesses wholesale closed. Um, the university closed down. Uh, and so I asked uh, our finance director, David Boyd, on the far right to propose two different scenarios. And uh, one being if, uh, and you can see at the bottom in the footnote, that if perhaps by the end of June, uh, that we're back to somewhat of a normal process, that businesses are reopened, uh, the university is coming back uh, and, and offering classes, and we, and we don't have any reason not to believe that's the case, um, but we, we do have to look ahead. Uh, so if that's the case, then the, fir the column there that uh, the proposed budget with the $144 million is the first number is what we could expect. Uh, then I asked for another sensitivity if there were uh, a continuance of the requirements that are in place, which would uh, have businesses shut down, the economy slowed, and perhaps the university not reengaged uh, by their own volition. Uh, and that could be a, a very serious impact uh, uh, as far as anticipated revenues. The expenditures will continue about the same because we, you know, at this point we're not recommending cutting back but that would be on the table if this continues on. And so there's a wide swing here of, of what other revenues and expenditures could look like for next year. While we're on this slide, I do want to call attention to the viewing public and the commissioners to uh, the items in green, the percentage of expenditures transfers out and the two month reserve amount. And then the bottom one is above or below target. And basically uh, the, the Unified government has attempted to have sufficient reserves to be in place in the case of uh, a debilitating uh, event or a downturn in the economy to preserve services going well. Think of it as a savings account or a rainy day fund. And um, that has been managed fairly well. Um, you know, we were. Uh, you know, even the commission was able to access some funds for the prosperity package and still keep um, the percentage of our transfers out at 16.4% in this current budget. Um, if the, the expenditures for FY20 are expected to come in less than budgeted. So a lot of credit goes to our departments and constitutional officers for spending less of their budget. So we, we are pro projecting even with the current um, slowdown and the revenue impacts we discussed in the earlier presentation, we may have a little bit of a surplus here, uh, you know, three plus million dollars um, that could be available for other purposes as well. Uh, but just looking ahead, uh, some of the signals about the economy, uh, that could become an important number uh, going forward. So I'll briefly talk about the revenues. Uh, some of this was alluded to earlier. Uh, so there is an estimated $8.6 million increase over the FY20 budget. You can see in the chart at the top how that's broken down. Uh, the property taxes are estimated to come in $5 million over last year. And that's based on the current millage rate of 13.95. Uh, the school district is at 20 uh, mills right now, and they're maxed out. But between the two, uh, that's what makes up most of athens Clark County's uh, residents tax bills is the school district plus the unified government and of course if you live in Winterville or Bogart you may have a little bit uh, added on top of that so the net growth in the taxable digest was 7.5 percent a little less than last year's really historic uh, growth of nine percent and that seven and a half percent is six percent reassessment and one and a half percent new growth uh, the the Title ad valorem tax is, is estimated to be at or slightly below FY20 budget. Uh, some of you talked about the millage rate and just uh, that third bullet point in our property taxes gives you a sense of how much a mill could be worth uh, either in adding it or subtracting it. Uh, it's about uh, of one mill would be equal to 4.5 million in property tax revenues. A uh, local option sales tax, um, for FY21 projected to be $2 million more uh, than the estimate for FY20. Um, other taxes, and these are things such as insurance premium tax, franchise fees, occupation tax certificates, which is business license in effect, 
Um, uh, that's estimated for FY21 to be 1 million more than the FY20 budget. And then other revenues, transfers in, uh, charges for services, fine revenue, license fee, parking fees, is estimated to be about 600,000 more than the FY20 budget. So we've got 8.6 million estimated to come in, and that is including uh, an estimated loss in sales tax uh, going into the rest of FY20 uh, based on this current crisis. So that, that figure is good, assuming that we've lost some sales tax revenue. So turning on to page four, uh, the expenditures and transfers out. So you got the $8.6 million. And uh, some things that, that I am suggesting, uh, I am proposing in the budget that I am now turning over to the mayor. And the mayor will continue to work with the commission on, on refining this and changing it to, to your liking. Um, we are, uh, I, 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 I I had hoped to have more of a pay increase or salary adjustment for our employees, but in light of the current pandemic, I've, I've had to um, suggest something less than that. And um, basically for, for general employees, it would be a 1% market adjustment in our performance uh, management program, which is basically a merit system, if you will, uh, where folks are reviewed and, and their scores, how well they've done correspond to how much of an increase they get but the PMP, as we call it, would average one and a half percent. So that's different from public safety employees. And I'll, I wanna give credit to um, the, the heads of our public safety agencies who have been working together in the past months uh, to come up, you know, rather than um, uh, not come forth with solutions, they have really been working on some ideas and have brought something forth that has some apparent merit. And we are having that vetted, um, but a, 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 a pay plan enhancement for public safety employees, which was uh, what we're calling a, a step plan. And it's not unusual for public safety uh, agencies, even in Georgia, where it's, it's, it's a more um, structured pay plan. Folks can be and see their path forward and um, you know longevity and good performance is rewarded, uh, and so we, we're not quite sure at this point uh, what the impact of that would be. But I've set aside one and a half million dollars uh, to help fund that, and there's more information to come for you on that. Um, I will mention too that on April 14th we do plan for the Human Resource Department to come to the Mayor and Commission's work session and give you that annual uh, presentation on benefits. Uh, and, and allow you to ask further questions. Uh, but for the purpose of Big Rocks, uh, we expect with employee health insurance that the employer contribution by, by the government will increase by about 500,000 overall, uh, 360,000 in the general fund. So for everybody, I mentioned enterprise funds earlier. There's a number of funds within the athens Clark County government. The general fund is the largest, uh, but for the employees in there, uh, 360,000. Retiree health insurance and life insurance uh, estimated to cost 6.6 .6 million, which is an increase of $600,000 overall and about 466,000 in the general fund. The pension trust fund contribution uh, is estimated to be uh, 10.7 million overall. That's an increase of 300,000 over FY20. I do wanna say though, uh, and everybody, most folks are acutely aware of this, that the stock markets have taken a huge hit. And when our investments are doing well, and, 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 and if the public didn't know, the unified government manages its pension trust fund. Um, there's a pension committee and um, uh, it, it, that watches this. It's done very well over the years. Uh, I think we're in the 80% range, 80 to 90% range funded, which is unusual for uh, defined benefit pensions in this day and age. Uh, but undoubtedly that portfolio is taking a hit. When that goes down and we wanna try to keep our uh, pension fund funded to a certain level, it means that the uh, unified government has to uh, contribute more funds. That being said, uh, the actuarial study will be done later this year and it could be that mid-year we come back looking to supplement that. But at, at this point, 
with what we know, we're going to uh, go with this contribution. Uh, the FY21 budget that's being proposed has contemplates a total of 17 positions uh, and three full-time positions converted from four part-time positions. Uh, some of these uh, are relevant to your goals and objectives, and certainly um, we've heard the need to be more transparent with the public from, from this commission loud and clear, and uh, the, the, the geographic in, uh, geospatial information office, which is a mouthful to say, but uh, helping us get a handle on data and, uh, it, you know, being able to have an open data portal transparency tech position dedicated towards getting information organized and shared with the public is something that we think is important. I mentioned earlier about a full-time communication strategist in the Office of Inclusion. In this case, this would be the one to work uh, deeper in our government to make sure that inclusion strategies are, are being uh, adhered to uh, and, and taking inspiration from our employees. And then the Neighbors Help and Neighbors program could have another position that would be housed in inclusion to work more externally. Uh, the counselor position in probation is something that um, would allow uh, more case management. Um, it, it would um, it would uh, it would allow more attention paid to those folks on probation and getting them connected with the services that they require. Uh, the deputy clerk and the clerk of courts, um, uh, Judge Haggard uh, and other judges have advocated for this. Uh, the Department of Community Supervision no longer provides staff to prepare service uh, sentences in court. And so that's falling to the clerk of courts to do that, and they would need a full-time deputy. And I will say that uh, clerk of courts Beverly Logan invited me over to actually sit during uh, proceedings to, to understand what that looks like, and I certainly understand the need for that. The corrections officers are, are meant to help uh, the diversion center, the reason for those folks, not only for uh, a relief factor, but we're bringing more people into the diversion center, trying to transition them out of the, 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 the prison proper and get them, um, to Commissioner Thornton's point, integrated more into the community, uh, get them jobs uh, so that when their sentence does wear off or they, they've met their obligation to the state, uh, they're able to walk away with a paycheck in their pocket and a job. And so uh, these two officers, actually four were requested, but we've, we've recommended two uh, to go with. Um, to the point earlier about SPLOST, uh, we cannot pay for maintenance and operation of SPLOST, but we, we continue to build things. And so uh, a landscape grounds worker in central services is needed with the extension of trails that we've continued to invest in. The full-time fleet training position in central services uh, is something that um, I'm proposing also be uh, split funded from workforce development, which is an initiative you approved last year. And here's the idea. So we have, we've been watching our mechanics and we lose mechanics to uh, the private sector uh, and the mechanics that stay with us have been long-term employees and they're retiring. And so we wanted to take uh, some of the inmates that, that work with us and let them do more than change tires or change oil and actually have a training position there to train these inmates a skill uh, in mechanics and hopefully they'll stay with us. Uh, we can hire them after they have satisfied their debts to society uh, and if we have enough in our uh, stable, if you will, if we have enough folks that, are, that, that can help us and um, the private mechanics can hire folks at, at good salaries, then that's even better that we're supporting the community with workforce development. So we're really excited about that, the prospect of that position. Um, there's There's been a need for some years with the increased activity with cultural affairs, uh, and we're, we're uh, recommending a public art program leader housed in leisure services to assist them with their work. And then as you know, there's been a lot of work going on with animal services uh, so that um, we want to convert two part-time positions to a full-time animal control officer position. Um, so we also support other funds. As I mentioned, there's the general fund uh, in the E911 fund, which the reason why it's separate from the general fund for the public viewing, the viewing public is that there are some revenues that we do receive from your telephone bill 
um, that we uh, receive from the state and we put aside dedicated for those purposes. But it is not enough to cover the operation. So taxpayer funds are transferred into that fund to help pay for that. And this would be a no exception. And Commissioner Neesmith was right. And, and my point earlier about uh, the reason I said I had added it to the group was just to explain why it, it wasn't part of the legislation last week. But this has been uh, the conversion to an emergency medical dispatch is something that's been talked uh, about very much by several commissioners, including Commissioner Neesmith. And something staff has been proposing uh, for several years now it's a big leap as far as expense. Uh, and over the last two or three years, we have been increasing um, the e on call taker positions one each year, trying to get to where we could step over the threshold. And we feel like that this is the time to do it. And so this would, this budget as proposed is uh, uh, proposing eight full-time communications officers for the emergency medical dispatch. And folks might say, well, why would you need so many additional people to make that happen. Well, currently, uh, a 911 call taker takes the call, uh, tries to ascertain the issue as quickly as possible, and then dispatches that to the appropriate agency. Uh, in this case, with an emergency medical dispatch protocol, and certainly I can provide more information about this, uh, the call takers are trained in emergency medical protocols, meaning that uh, if somebody's having a certain type of event, they can walk that person through providing some intermediate care until the EMTs can show up on site. Um, or they can uh, advise a, a person on their own what they can do to help themselves until there. So if you will imagine, that necessarily takes more time that you're gonna stay on the phone with the person or the family, that you're gonna give them directions uh, and feedback. And so if we have people taking longer on the phones and we wanna still be available for new calls coming in, we're going to have to have more people in in the um, 911 center and so uh, more to come on that and then in transit what we're finding is that the part-time positions you know in a in a in a in an economy that's typically doing pretty well we're having a hard time keeping them filled and we're ready to move to a full-time or two full-time maintenance workers in transit so those are the authorized positions um, and some of those are repeated later, and I, will, I won't go over those again. Increases to maintain current services. Um, and, and, and with this, y'all, and, and the capital budget, what you're going to see is that while uh, $8 million of new revenue seems like a lot of money, um, there's a couple things going on. One is that we are paying for capital expenses out of current year revenue. So meaning that out of that, those funds, we have to be able to generate uh, the capital needs, and I'll talk about those. But the themes this year have really been um, sort of funding what we have. And I think one of the commissioners, maybe Commissioner Wright, had said that at one point, you know, we've got to, to fund what we have. And uh, that is, you know, funding life cycle equipment cost replacements, um, the maintenance for the buildings that we have, um, you know, supplies that we need to, to carry out our services. And you can see that here in this section that this is not really new initiatives here. This is just funding what, there's increases that are required to fund things such as uh, medical supplies for animal services, um, increasing our poll worker hours to reflect the need there, additional training, uh, inmate medical costs and meals, uh, increasing the juror pay, which is what the grand jury recommended, our street light electricity cost year after year are underfunded. And so this is a, about three and a half million dollars uh, just to, to keep up with what we what we need to. But well, I'm sorry, three and a half million dollars worth of request, but about one point three million that that we we felt like at least needed to be funded. So getting close here, y'all. Uh, moving on to uh, page six here. <clears throat> the fleet replacement contributions and for the new commissioners, we talked briefly about this last year. Um, but early on as my tenure as manager, um, I came to understand that um, our fleet replacement plan was underfunded. And that was the um, cause of the last downturn that in cutting back on certain things that, that those contributions have been cut back on. And so four years ago, 
we created a five-year plan to get us back to where we needed to be. And for the viewing public, what, what we do with the unified government is rather than have wide swings in capital funding needs to replace vehicles, uh, when we purchase a vehicle, and really we should all do this if we, if, we, if we could, if we could afford it, is put back a little bit of money each year that when you have a car so that when the time comes to buy, buy a new one, you can pay for most of it or all of it. But that is one thing this government's been able to do. And so we want to get back on a self-sustaining um, funding mechanism. And so this does increase that slightly. SPLOS, T-SPLOS operating increases. I mentioned the central services, um, additional worker. And then in manager's office, you know, we've, uh, mayor and commission and this government have done an excellent job of acquiring more green space. Uh, and we need to take care of that and be good stewards. And so there's some funds there for that. Um, I'll skip along the new positions here that, that are at the bottom of page six, but you can see uh, some funding we've set aside. Uh, and, and I want to, again, the FY21 relief continuance there, the 500000 is not earmarked for any one plan. I will say this, with the Community Core program, which seemed to get some positive comments tonight, uh, if we actually begin to get the, those folks to build some things, and, and, and remember, too, y'all, that um, we're probably talking about fairly unskilled labor. And if we can develop some skilled labor through the program, that's all the much better. But we would need some we would need materials. And so we're going to have to pay some capital cost, if you will, uh, if we can't through SPLOST. Uh, and so those could be some of the funds for that. Um, the prosperity package, the, the remaining three million dollars from that, um, you were uh, contemplating how to spend that with the COVID-19 crisis. And so I've added this to our FY21 budget to continue the Neighborhood Leaders Program and Grant Writers Program, which you approved last year. Corridor beautification, I want to call out the good work of the Corridor Committee um, um, that is looking at all things corridor, not just beautification. And um, they had requested that the Mayor and Commission uh, fund up to a little over $250,000 uh, I'm trying to uh, meet several needs here. I have at least $75,000 in there. You may choose to augment that. I think that uh, the, the master plan that the committee has worked on is a good one. The next one is, is an important concept that I want, want everybody, if you only hear a few things tonight, to, to think about this. And that is uh, we've done an excellent job of convincing the public that recycling is free. Uh, but it is not. It is a commodity. Uh, and as we know, several years ago uh, with the Beijing Olympics, we saw the recycling commodity markets take a nosedive and they never really quite um, recovered. And so in order to continue um, waste reduction education efforts, uh, KCCB, um, the work of processing the recyclables, uh, all of that amounts to a little over a million dollars a year and it has to come from somewhere. Well, up till now, it's come from the Landfill Enterprise Fund. And again, the Landfill Enterprise Fund, everybody that stayed with me this long, uh, the Enterprise Fund is funded by charges for services. So the landfill charges people a fee, and it charges haulers a fee, and it charges our haulers, uh, the, the government itself, it charges because we need to pay for the services. Um, and so if you can imagine when you have a fund that has limited revenues having to make up a million dollars a year in expenses that, that you know, it, it's, it's bringing the uh, overall fund balance of that down. And we can talk more about that, but not unlike the fleet replacement contribution. When we, when we found things like this, we want to try to gracefully glide it back to where it needs to be. And so what we're proposing is a three year transition uh, or so of transitioning those recycling costs to the general fund and taking the pressure off the landfill enterprise fund. Now that's open for, for your scrutiny and discussion and, and amendment. I mean, you know, you could raise fees at the landfill to cover some of the costs. There's any number of ways to do this. This is just sort of a, a first cut at this uh, for you to consider. Um, we need to expand some cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, there's, there's a lot of activity out there right now. I, I want to give our IT staff um, 
a ton of credit for the work that's been done in the last few years. Um, certainly our transition to voice over IP uh, has enabled us to be prepared to be able to have this very meeting uh, in using this technology. Um, and they have kept us safe uh, to date with cybersecurity, but that, that we need to remain vigilant with that. Um, you can see some of the others here, a lot of which I've already spoke about. Um, going on to page seven, independent agencies and public defender's office. Um, there's been a request for there. Uh, the mayor did request that we consider 70,000 for library staff pay adjustments. So I've tried to create some room there and I know he's gonna continue working with that suggestion. Uh, and the circuit public defender's office has, has requested some more funds and we wanted to uh, try to meet that as well. Uh, general fund operating transfers to other funds. The transit fund we're suggesting to, to supplement. A few years ago, um, we recognized that there was a pretty good level of working capital, which is akin to fund balance. And so we challenged uh, Director Butch McDuffie and his staff uh, to decrease the amount of general fund transfers to their fund to help increase the health of our general fund. And for those of you that, um, if you'll indulge me for one second, I'm gonna go back to the first slide. What we were seeing, and you may remember this presentation from Finance Director Boyd, uh, but if you look at net change in fund balance, uh, the third uh, line down and the first figure being 1.5 million in red in FY16, uh, our fund transfers, general fund transfers were escalating there. And so in FY17 going into FY18, we began to try to turn the tide on that. Um, and we did. And so that was one of the several things that, that we asked is let, let's decrease these transfers out and try to keep the general fund whole. I wanna say that you can see in FY19 that we ended up back in the positive, which is certainly a good trend not entirely due to our efforts though that was also due to a very good year in revenues as well so we'll go back here real quick um uh, i mentioned that the transfer to the e911 fund and the airport fund uh director mike matthews uh, joined us gosh a little almost two years ago a little under two years ago and his one of his and the airport authority's goals was to try to help the airport become more self-sufficient. And we're hopeful that they can actually pull that off this year after the uh, runway being shut down. And so we're trying to cut down on those transfers. I won't go through all the capital programs, but if you just take a quick look at those, I think you'll see the commonality there, that it's repair and maintenance, it's life cycle, uh, it's replacement. Um, there's not a lot of new stuff here. It's just trying to take care of what we have. Um, I mentioned about the two sensitivities we had as far as uh, the lasting effects of the COVID impact. Um, and we, if, if, if those materialize uh, for the next six to nine months, then there's gonna be some hard decisions to make uh, to be sure. Uh, so Mayor, that's what I wanted to present today and uh, tonight, and I'm standing ready for any questions. Thank you, Manager okay, Williams. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at the front end, um, uh, we don't really uh, look to sort of extended uh, exploration of sort of line items, but um, what this is a good time for is just sort of getting anything on the table for further exploration or examination. Um, and certainly anything that commissioners have over, say, let's say the next two weeks um, are, are definitely early enough to get sort of baked into the entirety. Uh, and so I know a handful of commissioners have some interest in um, kind of putting some of the elements uh, that, that you'd like to see out there. So I, I'll just start with Commissioner Hamby and go in uh, reverse order through the group. So, Commissioner Hamby. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. I know Commissioner Nancy Smith was anxious there. Um, my, uh, I have a, you know, uh, Manager Williams brought up the pension trust fund and, and uh, I'm on that, uh, uh, board that does that and we have been looking at uh, ways to move for towards a fully funding which if we ever could get to that point would kind of save the general fund a lot of money from that regard so 
I don't know what this, I, I think this whole discussion is good, but I do agree, agree with the fact that we don't know what the impact of, of, of the virus is going to have on our local economy and on our local revenues uh, from, from that standpoint. I will, will say this, though, I mean, I, I, a lot of new positions being added it raises a little bit of, uh, of uh, a, a, a bit of pause for concern there a little bit, you know, maybe we could figure out a way to re-examine or re, you know, maybe there's some um, some different ways we, we can satisfy those war work within our current current um, current um, structure of, of, of employees from that standpoint. But I will say also, we kind of lost over the capital improvements program. And if I can pull it up here on a on my phone, I mean, we've got $860,000 for care and maintenance. Uh, eight hundred thousand for facilities life cycle, six hundred thousand for pavement. I'm just going to take take out these two, the pavement and the parks. We just passed a splash program that includes uh, redoing uh, quite a bit of our parks. Uh, we're borrowing some money uh, to, uh, to to start the splash effort. So maybe maybe some of that eight hundred sixty thousand dollars getting some of that. Getting some of that, getting some of those repairs started early on some of those parks that we borrowed. We've got T-Splice money out there for and, and the six hundred thousand dollar payment maintenance program. Could that not be paid for out of the T-Splice program? And I know the answer is going to be well, we've got a long list of repaving that needs to be done. That's true, um, but you know, in this time and these times that we're facing, we we kind of have to look at different ways of of, of doing things and. And, and, and looking at different sources that we have and different sources that our, that our community has already approved. So, so uh, I, guess, I guess that's, uh, that's where I'm going with that. I mean, I would also like to say with, I'm glad we're moving forward with the 911 operations. I'd kind of like to see what that would look like if we went with that. Uh, um, I think I remember option four when we had that presentation a while back that kind of, kind of gets with that system uh, and seeing what the price difference would be between what you have here and what option that option for uh, so just just food for thought I, I like I mean I'm glad we did this I think it I think the situation is going to change though and uh, and I'm, I know we'll be able to bring up other things during the during the budget cycle so, thanks thanks Commissioner Commissioner Thornton this is my just my two cents worth for it's worth. Commissioner Thornton. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I'm just waiting my turn. Commissioner Thornton. Right, uh, I'm gonna move on to Commissioner Herod. Um, all right, thank you. Um, I had two questions, I guess. One, one is for our attorney and one is for our manager. So the question for the manager is, um, I see that you have, um, I think it's eight physicians in here for um, 911 emergency dispatching in the police department, is that correct? Yes, sir. So are those positions, um, do they count as being as filling some of the shortfall in the ACCPD offices that we presently have? Uh, no, sir. And you're referring to the chart that we showed with the vacancies uh, in the resiliency. Yes, because I, I know that ACCPD is not up to its full complement. And I know that they are this certainly this COVID-19 um, situation has really stretched them um, and I know that they've been you know short staff for several years and um, <clears throat> I know this is going to be a tough budget year but I, I think you know public safety is one of the most important things that we do as a local government and I would like to see us be able to try and whittle down that um, shortfall in the number of officers if, if we're able to do that. Yes, sir, and, and it's the hope of the, uh, the the heads of the public safety agencies that the pay plan um, um, enhancement would, would help to do that. I am glad you brought that up. Uh, no, the 
additional communication officers would be new positions and not filling any vacancies. Mm -hmm. um, and in so doing, I also want to say this, we're trying to be smart about this. Mm -hmm. uh, July 1st starts our year. Well, you're not going to have eight full-time people hired on July 2nd. Yep. Um, so this contemplates four positions hired in by September 1st and another four in January 1st. Uh, so that's 320,000 for this year. And the reason I bring that up is the following year when July 2nd happens and you do have eight people in those positions, the actual cost will be 450,000. So this is a commitment to the future budget uh, once those positions are filled, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But well, that, those positions will not be um, post-certified sworn officers, is that correct? That's my understanding, yes, sir. But they, there is a great deal of training to be uh, with the uh, EMD protocols. Oh, no, and I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, suggesting that there isn't, and I'm, I'm not arguing against moving in this direction. I'm just saying that in terms of, you know, cops on the beat, we're down a large number, and public safety is one of the things that's really, you know, that's what local government does, and I would like to see us at some point moving in a direction where we can um, <clears throat> increase the number of people we have on the payroll because, amongst other things, it saves us on reducing overtime at some point. You're, you're absolutely right, Commissioner, as well as uh, the amount of money that we invest in training sworn officers uh, just to lose them for, you know, a, a little more money to another agency. Um, you know, there's some efficiencies in trying to keep them here. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question I had, so I'm looking at, um, I, I guess on page two, scenario number one, scenario number two, um, and so scenario number two assumes the COVID-19 prevention requirements remain in effect through fall of 2020. So obviously we vote on the budget in June. It goes into effect July 1. If we, um, if we vote on a budget based on scenario number one, and of course the Constitution requires us to have a balanced budget, if we vote based on scenario number one, and then we end up in scenario number two, and we end up with a 17 million and some dollar shortfall, uh, how do we address that? Will we come back and do a supplementary budget? Or, or I know that we can't, we can't uh, budget deficit when we uh, uh, adopt to the budget, but um, if we have a, a shortfall, can we roll that over into the next year? Or would we have to come back and, and amend the budget in, let's say, November? That's a great question. <clears throat> and and I, my answer is that there's a variety of ways in which you can do that. <clears throat> One is uh, if we're still in a period of uncertainty, uh, we can hold back on any, any, any spending if, if we can, uh, delay the hiring, if you will, uh, to see how, you know, give us more time to understand what the impacts may actually look like. You could elect to use uh, some of your uh, unrestricted or unassigned fund balance uh, you know, that you've saved for that rainy day to help supplement and pay for the services, even as it, the revenues aren't materializing. So yes, Commissioner, there is the opportunity to come back mid-year or during the year and make budget amendments uh, to react to this um, or go into your reserves or both. Okay, all right, because I, I mean, what I see happening is in some ways, some of our expenses may actually be reduced because i mean gasoline is extremely cheap right now so we may actually save a little bit on um fuel costs but the biggest problem is going to be our, our loss in revenues uh particularly with um sales tax agreed right, thank you uh, commissioner edwards I'd like to uh, I'd like to echo what Commissioner Hamby brought up about these transfers to the capital programs and exploring uh, shifting all of that as much as possible to SPLOST and uh, build up our reserves to be in the best prepared state for uh, coronavirus uh, effects on our economy and. Uh, be ready for budget amendments. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Neesmith. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, I would like to see us uh, look at as far as landfill fees. I'd like to see uh, the option for raising landfill fees, not because I'm in favor of it. I'd just like to see what that impact would be. Uh, this is trivial, I know, but you know me. Uh, I'd like to see what this money for cybersecurity in, uh, improvement is. I have no doubt that it's needed, but I'm curious. Help me there. Um, I, I think we need to take a bit of a different approach on budget setting this year. We don't know where we will be in July, August, and September. Uh, I would propose that we put together a quarter, a, a budget for the first quarter, which will be very, very conservative. Our, our, our actions for alcohol licenses and, and many other things are going to impact our budget. We need a first quarter budget that takes into consideration those impacts and also the possibility that our sales tax revenues remain low. Hopefully we'll have a football season. I think we will, but we might not. And then we could also have a budget for the remaining, uh, the remainder of the year, which we can revisit uh, in September, uh, depending on what the conditions are at that time. I want to take a very conservative approach. We talked about approaching this pandemic, the pandemic, by by not being feeling too bad about uh, doing too much. I think we should take the same approach with the budget. Let's take that first quarter, and let's don't do too much. Let's be conservative. We don't want to rush around in the second quarter and figure out what we've got to cut. Let's cut it in the first quarter. In the second quarter, we'll know where we are. Um, which would, would include, let's delay position, hiring for all positions through the first quarter. Um, I also think that the pavement program, I think, again, we should look at that, as, as others have said, and let's uh, rely on SPLOS SPLOS money for a year. I know it's going to be painful. People are going to like it. There's streets that need to be paved. But I also think the citizens will understand. Um, I want to understand more about the, what the impact of the um, E911 positions would be and how that would improve our response to emergency medical calls. What I heard you say, Blaine, was that we would have trained, um, trained E911 uh, uh, folks who could handle an emergency situation. I'm all for that. But we still have the problem of that delay we have uh, in getting that call over to uh, national EMS. I want to see what, what the impact of this would be on that delay. And last, uh, I think we need to look at that AC, that the, at the police department pay plan. I think you're right. I think we could, we'll save money in the long run by being able to pay our officers a salary that keeps them here. And, uh, you know, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I guess first to start with, um, and echoing uh, Commissioner E. Smith, Commissioner Edwards a little bit about, uh, especially Commissioner Edwards saying, like, be ready for budget amendments. Um, I would like us maybe to start considering right now us pushing back voting on our budget to the end of June rather than the first week of June like we normally do. Um, it wouldn't be a huge amount of time, but somewhere between like around four weeks, and I think with a with those extra four weeks around that timeline, uh, we might be in a much better position to be able to estimate what this next fiscal year is going to look like. So I would kind of like us maybe even like to change our timeline now for us thinking that we're going to be doing this at the end of June rather than the beginning. Um, I yeah on the EMS. Um, I agree. I, I, I mean, yeah. I want us to pursue option number four. Um, I, I did pull up the recommendations that Manager Williams brought up, and when you go through that that document, option number four is the recommended one, where our own central communications will be discussing things with people as they call in, including medical stuff, but they will be the ones actually. Um, dispatching and be connected to the EMS units. Uh, uh, here on the document it says disadvantages for option number three 
uh, this workflow does not address the fragmented system created between ACC Central Communications and National EMS. Additionally, oh, it says, yeah, this solution would offer no noticeable benefit to the speed in which EMS calls are dispatched and an ambulance is placed en route. Um, if, and the, the difference from what I see here is the difference between uh, having to bring on eight additional staff compared to 10. If for two additional staff people, we can actually get those outcomes that we desperately want and need, like having faster dispatched ambulances and being able to get rid of the fragmented system that is between ACC Communications and National EMS. To me, those are high priorities and I want to see us fund those. Um, especially since we're going to get 80% of the way there with option three, let's just go, let's do 100%. Why, take, why spend 80% of the cost but only get like 25% of the benefit? It's just not, a, it's like not cost effective. Um, on the public safety, uh, I, I agree. I've, I've, I've actually, I heard a little bit about uh, the, the stepping grade compensation system. Um, and it, it sounds pretty good as long as, uh, like Manager Williams said, as long as it comes back that uh, it all kind of vets out. Um, I would like us to pursue that. I would like us to see, though, we're talking about our... Um, our police department and how our, we have our officer breakdown. I want to see us uh, investing a lot more into our crisis intervention teams, a lot more. Every time I talk to uh, anybody to do with our criminal justice system, and I ask what is working, one of the first things out of their mouth is our crisis intervention units. Right. Yet we only have two of them. And we can look right. over the last year, all the incidents that happened in our community which a lot of them were mental health related crises. I we should I want to see I want to see us have a lot more of those units with that different kind of approach. And I think it would be great for us to have that mental health care focused approach, but then we also have the law enforcement approach within under the same umbrella. And I think that would be great. And I think that it, it would benefit our officers because right now we're sending them into situations that they are not the appropriate force to be going into. And we put the, our officers in danger, and we put our in, the individuals in our community in danger. Um, and so I would like us to see if that's that's one of my the biggest priorities I would like to see us um, putting some extra money behind. Um, and yeah, that's uh, about it. Uh, I, I do agree that we need to be a little bit cost, especially going into this first quarter. And I think by giving ourselves about an extra month to come up with that budget and see where the economy is at and see where this pandemics that will benefit us. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Wright. Hey there, thank you. Um, Manager Williams, I think what I said was repair what is there. Thank you, <laughs> sorry, I, I couldn't remember exactly. Well, you, you know, that's okay, you did refer to it and it, it is important, um, but I think while all households are battening down the hatches, we all have to be able to repair what is there. But um, I do wanna be cautious with um, the new staffing, although I do agree with your list, uh, the top of my list would be the public safety related ones. Um, so what, here's, here are my questions that you can um, get back with me about. Um, in the public safety details, it said we had, uh, I think, 20 trainees with the police department. I just wanted to be sure that we are maintaining funding for all the positions in there so that we can move in uh, the people. Okay. And then um, the deputy clerk uh, that's in recommended as a position, I wanted to make sure that that is resolving the uh, external financial audit findings that we were seeing about the courts. If you'll confirm that in emails. Sure. Uh, real to, quick, I can answer that, that real now? quick. Yeah. Uh, Y'all approved, I think, a couple of years ago, a new position in the courts to take care of that particular finding, which is a good memory that you had. Um, this un it does not. Uh, so the clerk of courts, as far as any uh, issues with uh, being able to have the appropriate oversight over the funds that are taken and accounted for, that's taken care of. This is purely uh, a sentencing need that the state is no longer supporting that we're going to have to backfill. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the uh, 
the um, the public defender's request, um, we got a very um, informative document from them, uh, and I did agree that we should support their recommendations. And I wanted to be clear that what you have in the big rocks is the extent of what was asked for. And you might have to answer that in the email. That's okay. Um, because we, we got some informative information, but it didn't have the dollar amount in it. And I just wanted to, to learn about that. Um, the transit, uh, I do want to continue to support what we need to do to keep our transit service um, applicable in the routes. Um, I've wanted us to be able to make sure we, it's sustainable to maybe improve routes uh, or expand routes. But I think now with what's going on, we need to uh, make it as accessible for folks. I think more people are gonna be able to need to use that relief. And so if you could keep an eye out for state and federal funds that are gonna be able to help us afford to be able to have fare free uh, service during, during and after um, this uh, public health emergency so that we can continue to either to pay for what we have and to keep um, it reliable and connected people to where they need to be. I think that covers the comments at this point and thanks, thanks for those who are still hanging in there with us. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Link? Yeah, um, I want to agree that we do need to be as fiscally conservative as possible on the front end, and and I do I do think uh, Commissioner Denson has a good idea of like waiting till the last possible moment to approve the budget because things are changing on a day by day basis with this crisis. Um, so you know we could be things could be very different the first week of June than they are the third or fourth week of June. <laughs> Um, and I, I also, I think most other people addressed some of my concerns um, when it came to the dispatch and the public safety. Um, I, I do have concerns about the, the police officers versus the crisis officers. And, you know, I would like to get more information on how effective those crisis positions have been and, and if we would not be better off trading out one or two police officer positions for one or two crisis intervention officers or adding another crisis in their intervention team um, or expanding that program in some way because, yeah, it, it seems like a, a good portion of emergency calls are rooted in some kind of mental health or domestic conflict issue that is more of a, um, more of a crisis than a crime. And um, I'm going to bring up something that I bring up every year, and I think it's even more important to talk about this year, is the um, liquor licensing fees and the need to tier that program. Um, I feel like it's a real injustice on our small businesses that uh, a bar that or a restaurant that only seats like 30 or 40 people is paying the same beer, wine, and liquor license fees as, you know, a, a venue that can host hundreds, um, you know, the, those larger venues can can cover those fees in, in a single night, whereas some of these small little neighborhood pub style places or, you know, really small cafe style restaurants that, you know, really need to keep a beer and wine license, um, they have a, a harder time. It takes them months and months to squirrel away the, the funding to cover those fees every year. So I really would like us to see a tiered program for that that's either based on seating capacity um, or or even like linear footage of bar. Um, I think there's a big difference between, you know, a small neighborhood pub and, you know, the kind of feedlot style <laughs> drinking establishments that, that some of these places seem to amount to. So I, I would like to ask staff to, to come up with um, a, a tiered version of that. And, and especially now that you know, these businesses, I mean, we're probably going to lose some of our small locally owned businesses, our, our cafes and some of our beloved local bars. Well, Mayor, if I might, um, uh, Mr. Lincoln, I assume you were finished. Sorry. I, I am. The uh, Just because a couple of y'all mentioned this, I believe the charter calls 
there's a deadline in the charter for the approval of the budget, uh, but we'll research that and let you know. I do I appreciate the prudence that y'all are showing and in, in trying to understand with the latest data on making decisions, though, I understand that. I do think we have a deadline in the charter, but I'll check that. Uh, Commissioner Parker. You're not mute. You're muted, Mariah. Yeah, Mariah. You can see my mouth moving, but no words come out. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Now we're talking. All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> and I want also, wanted to also thank my fellow commissioners for the feedback they've given so far. You brought up a lot of really good points that kind of helped me see that some of this data in a uh, new way um, as well. I think I need to, uh, to take some time to think on some of this and provide more detailed fe feedback via email in the coming days once I've looked at it some more. I do want to say that I agree with Commissioner Herod that public safety is one of the most critical things we do, but I think that we need to think about public safety from a perspective of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, more basic than security and safety in terms of law and order are physiological needs like food, water, shelter, rest. And I think I'm excited, enthusiastic that um, this version of the budget so far has continued investment in Neighborhoods Helping Neighbors program, particularly if a version of that encompasses the Athens Mutual Aid Network, um, that it's got continued investment in the Neighborhood Leaders program. Um, echoing some of my uh, fellow commissioners, um, I am somewhat skeptical of pay increases for law enforcement, particularly it's being sh sh kind of shoehorned into the package of relief efforts, as I'm also more interested in seeing increased investments go toward converting some of those positions toward those crisis intervention officers or teams. Um, a lot of the public safety concerns I'm fielding from constituents right now um, in regards to the crisis are not the kind that require an armed response. And so while I do think we need more people on the ground, um, I think what kinds of work those people are trying to do is something that we should continue to discuss going forward as we approach um, public safety investments. Um, and then the last thing I'll echo is the need for us to adopt option four under the EMS upgrades. It's a system that's been used in other parts of the state. So like Commissioner Jensen cited a lot of the reasons why we might as well go forward with the additional investment to go all the way with the system. Um, and I will get back to you with more tomorrow. Yeah, thanks commissioner. And, and for you and everyone uh, really, as you kind of think about this, um, you know, look at the next two week horizon as time to interject things that you might not have come up with tonight or, or, or things that you know, upon further consideration you want to see. Uh, Commissioner Davenport. <clears throat> yes, um, considering the fact that, you know, we started the budget process in, I believe, in September and it's been a couple of months and due to this unforeseen and unplanned um, pandemic, which pretty much started the first of this month that um, I'm quite sure that the people who, who uh, the department, excuse me, who put together the budget was not prepared for the situation to take place. So I would recommend that, you know, um, you know, let, let's get, I would really like for us to reevaluate the, um, the current budget as posed because, um, um, you know, adding new positions in a time of crisis when considering the fact that we may not have a football season, those tax revenues may not come in and um, that, um, you know, creating these new positions may not be in, in good taste. But um, but I look forward to working with you guys and and department heads to and Blaine, excuse me, to make sure that we have an, a more appropriate budget. And of course, I'm for option number four. That's what the police department recommended. Um, I think um, for public safety issues, that that's a, that's a great option to go for. And um, I'm missing anything to do. And I would like just to echo what Commissioner Herod, Neesmith, Hamby, and Denton um, had alluded to about just, um, just working with our budget and making sure that, you know, we're fiscally sound. That's it. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, all right. Um, uh, we need to go ahead and um, hear a motion to- May May Mayor? Yeah, Mayor. Yeah. Hey, Ovita. I, I am back. here. I've been here, but I had to step away from a sec. But I, only thing I, I wanted to put out, I, I, I really need to look at the budget a little bit more, uh, and I didn't have much to add. But 
Um, one thing I wanted to put out there, I know that the state was talking about doing some major cuts um, before the crisis. And whatever we do with the, the budget, I hope that we're talking to our delegates to find out where and how those crises could impact our, um, our local budget. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think if we're going to make a sound budget, whatever that is, we really need to figure out what the... Um, what the state is going to do because it will impact us um, in the long run. That was the other thing. I'm going to look at the numbers and everything as myself again, and I'll I'll, I'll um, provide more feedback. But I think that's just a general thing that we should not overlook. Thanks, Commissioner. Sure. Helpful. Um, all right. Given that we have to enter executive session, I, I do need a motion for uh, entering a special called session. So moved. All right. Second. Got a motion from Commissioner Neesmith. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. All right. Uh, I've got a second from Commissioner Wright. Uh, all in favor of uh, entering special called session for the purpose of an executive session? Aye. 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 All right. Do I hear any opposed? All right. Uh, hearing none. Um, uh, I'll, I'll take a motion to enter that executive session. So moved. And Mr. Mayor, to clarify, yeah. let's discuss litigation uh, matters. Uh, uh, th thank you, Attorney Drake. Uh, it's an executive session specifically for litigation matters. Got a motion from Commissioner Neesmith. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. I've got a second from Commissioner Denson. All in favor of entering executive session? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? All right, uh, everybody, uh, it is 9.38 by my clock. If, uh, if, if you could go, um, you know, uh